Uh, so seeing the presence of a quorum, I am going to call the special meeting of the Committee on Outreach, Communications, and Appointments to order at 7.35 p.m. on April 16, 2020. Uh, I want to give just a first a little bit of context uh, for the public who is joining us tonight uh, about what we're doing here and why we're doing it. Uh, and so the sole purpose of tonight's meeting is to consider candidates for appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, this process started back in September uh, after the Town Council had appointed a full set of regular members and three associate members to the Zoning Board of Appeals last spring. Uh, there was a resignation of a regular member on September 10th. On September 12th, we posted a vacancy notice, but at the time the town council elected to hold off on filling that vacancy, instead allowing the ZBA to use their associate members. Uh, we reposted that vacancy notice in February, expecting uh, more vacancies. And in March, we had two additional vacancies, one of an associate member, one of a regular member, and then an additional, vac uh, an additional resignation in April of a regular member. So at this point, the Zoning Board of Appeals has two regular members, two associate members. And so there are several regular, there are several vacancies, both for regular members and for associate members. And so this meeting tonight is to interview candidates who are interested in appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals as either regular members or associate members. Prior to tonight's meeting, OCA developed interview questions and selection guidance, both of which were shared with the interviewees and are publicly available on the town's website. Uh, tonight's interviews will be used by OCA to make a recommendation to the town council, which will then vote on that recommendation and potentially appoint new members to the Zoning Board of Appeals or reappoint current members to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, regarding the format of tonight's interviews, all three, uh, I mean, sorry, all seven applicants will be interviewed as a group. Per an earlier vote of OCA, I as chair will ask all interview questions. Uh, my colleagues on the committee are all here tonight. They are here to listen. They will not be asking questions. After I ask a question of the group, each applicant will be given an opportunity to respond to that question. Per an earlier vote by this committee, each applicant will have up to three minutes to respond to the question. If you start to go over three minutes, I'll just politely interject and ask you to wrap up. Um, we will rotate the order of responses. So we will start with uh, alphabetical order, but then we will rotate the responses for each question. Um, at this point, are there any questions from the interviewees regarding this format? No? There we go. I don't have any questions. OK. Um, so uh, seeing none, the first thing I want to do is I want to just go through and make sure that uh, everyone can hear me and we can hear everyone. So I am just going to call through first the interviewees and then the members of the committee to ensure that everyone can be heard. So when Evan, I call your name, just, yes. This is Keith. Hi, Keith. I have two questions. Oh, go ahead. Given that this is a public meeting. Yep. Who are the two uh, regular members who are not who are no longer going to be on the ZBA? Uh, so there are three regular members three. who have resigned their positions uh, since the initial appointment last year. Yeah. Uh, those people are Matthew Wilk, um, Mark Parent, and Thomas Simpson. Okay. Um, and who are the two associate members who left? Uh, so we had uh, one resignation of an associate member, Aaron Arcello. Uh, we have two current associate members, both of whom are with us tonight, Tammy Parks and Sharon Waldman, um, who are up for reappointment. Okay. Now the next question is, who in fact comprises the committee that we are talking to? Uh, so I can let them introduce themselves um, in just a minute. This is a subcommittee of the council, so it's composed of five councilors. Okay. Um, so why don't we go through and just make sure that we can hear every one of the interviewees and then I will let each member of the committee um, just briefly introduce themselves. Uh, so Peter Barrett, can you just unmute so we can make sure we can hear you? 
Peter, you're muted right now. Oh, I just press the space button. There we go. Okay, uh, I thought you had muted me. But oh, no. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, and I and, and I can hear and see you and everyone else. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob Greeny? Yep, here. Okay. Uh, Keith Langsdale? Yes. Here you. Uh, Dylan Maxfield? Hello, Sam. All right. Uh, Craig Meadows? Craig, are you there? You need to unmute. I'm, I am here. Okay, great. Uh, Tammy Parks. Here. And Sharon Walden. I'm right here. Okay, great. And thank you all for not only being interested in serving, joining us tonight, but also uh, being understanding and patient as we navigate this new Zoom meeting reality. Um, so I'll now ask the members of this committee, uh, Outreach Communications and Appointments, just to uh, introduce themselves. We'll start with uh, Councilor Brewer. So I'm Alyssa Brewer and I am a town councilor at large. I also just wanted to ask Evan, you probably, I'm probably usurping something you were going to say later, but should we normally have everyone on mute and they should push to talk on their space bar because I'm hearing a lot of background noise in some yep. people's okay. homes. So yes, I was going to say that. Yep. Um, uh, councilor Dumont. Hi, um, I'm Darcy Dumont. I'm a counselor from District 5, which is South Amherst. Okay, uh, I'm Evan Ross. I'm a counselor from District 4 uh, and chair of this committee. Uh, counselor Ryan? Hi, uh, George Ryan, uh, representing District 3. Okay. And Councillor Schwartz? That's exactly right. Sarah Schwartz, and I am a town counselor from District 1. Okay, great. So we have everyone here. We can hear everyone. Uh, as Alyssa said, I'm going to ask that everyone stay muted except when uh, it is time for you to talk just to cut down on background noise. So I will, uh, the format will be I will ask a question um, and then I will call on each individual person to unmute themselves um, and answer the question. Uh, this is the first of two meetings tonight. This meeting will be for the interviews. The interviews will be the sole agenda item. After the interviews conclude, we will adjourn this meeting. We will take a short break, and then the committee members will reconvene uh, to deliberate. So there are no questions. Then I will begin the interviews. Just pull up the... Okay. So. The first question is, what is your understanding of the role of the ZBA? And I will ask first, Peter Barrick, please unmute. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Uh, as I understand it, <clears throat> the Zoning Board of Appeals is governed by the town's zoning laws. And the role of the Board of Appeals uh, is to deal with requests for exceptions from the zoning laws. Uh, and I assume that in making those judgments, the Board of Appeals is, is guided uh, by the, the spirit of the laws. I, 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 on your website, there are descriptions of circumstances such as the particular topography of a site or the particular uh, needs of, of, an, uh, of an, someone who's applying um, for a waiver. Uh, that get into that have to be taken into consideration, and I assume the Board of Appeals uh, looks for decision, look, tries to make decisions which serve the welfare of the town, the welfare of the neighbors of whoever is applying for an exception, uh, and also to take an interest in the welfare of the person who is applying for the exception. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to Bob Greeny. Um, <clears throat> so the description I read and it is confirms my understanding, it's a quasi-judicial body <clears throat> and it makes judgments about our zoning laws. And <clears throat> there's some interesting language in the description that I read about protecting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the public of Massachusetts, of the citizens of Massachusetts. So 
anyway, I, that's my understanding. It's uh, the zoning is written and, and in cases where it's not clear, um, we make judgments on uh, what follows those laws. So it, I, I would guess in most cases, uh, the, uh, the, the law spells out pretty clearly what needs to be done. And it's up to us to interpret and make sure that law is followed or those bylaws are followed. And uh, only in cases where there's some ambiguity, then we exercise our best judgment in the interest of the town according to those guidelines. Okay. Great, thank you. I will turn to Keith Langsdale. <laughs> You're still you're still muted. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, okay. Um, well, the ZBA is, as someone mentioned, a quasi-judicial body. Uh, it means that we apply the laws; we don't make the laws. Um, we have to follow the ten point three eight uh from the uh, uh bylaws in making the findings and to prepare for a vote um we have to listen to the comment of the public uh and provide the uh, applicants uh the opportunity to respond if in fact there are uh public comments uh, the zba basically i think is a conduit from these laws from the town and the people and it, it, who are the applicants and it's very important that we understand these laws and how they can be applied in terms of um bringing the applicant and the community together so that um, it, it all uh, enhances the neighborhood and the, um, the master plan for the uh, Amherst. Uh, yeah, so that's what I would say. Great, thank you, Keith. Uh, Dylan Maxfield. It's yeah, so my understanding of the, uh, the ZBA. Yes, it's the quasi-judicial body. It's, uh, yeah, they don't make the zoning laws. Um, and I think when our, our zoning laws are supposed to be in such a way that it's, it's not so rigid that there are no exceptions. And if it was, we wouldn't have the ZBA. It's up to the ZBA when appeals come to us that we have to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis of what the right course of action is and hearing from, um, you know, whoever the applicant is, also hearing from the public about what the impact is, and then trying to make the right decision um, in that, in any particular instance going forward, you know, what is, what is the best way that we can uphold our zoning laws, the spirit of our zoning laws, especially while still trying to accommodate um, applicants, while also especially accommodating um, the residents of Amherst. Great, thank you, Dylan. Uh, Craig Meadows. I think everything that everyone said is certainly pertinent to what the ZBA stands for. Uh, it seems as though most of what the ZBA actions are are for special permit act applications for residents and commercial spaces. Um, and to deal with those gray areas that are not completely covered in the laws and bylaws of the town, such that um, when, there, when there is not a distinct uh, law that covers the instance of what's going to happen, uh, and that the ZBA is brought in to, to deal with those issues. Okay, thank you, Craig. Uh, Timmy Parks. 
Hi, this is going to be repetitive, but it's to hold hearings for um, special permit applications for residential and business uses not allowed by right. And we operate under the uh, Mass General Law Chapter 40A and under the Zoning Bylaw 10.38 uh, to promote health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. That's what I have to say. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. And Sharon. So mute yourself. There we, there we go. go. Alt A. I was wondering what that was. Okay. All right. So yeah, everyone did a really fabulous job. Particularly Tammy, like swooping in on there on the end. <laughs> but you know what I have learned through sitting through the meetings is we do an awful lot of education of the citizens of Amherst, particularly neighbors, about um, and then and then we uh, about what special conditions can do for them. And then we think about um, as a group and we uh, about what special conditions may address some of the concerns that we hear either from the public, either in person or in writing. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a tough road to hoe in Amherst. There's, there's a really, there's a big population of, of long timers. And then we have this really large college and that's really where a lot of the conflict kind of lies um and i'm sad we lost mark because i think he did a good job of educating um people and then i i feel like we did a really good job as a board um coming up with special conditions to address everyone's concerns and to kind of balance um you know some of the reality of the neighborhoods changing from say single family homes into rentals uh, you know, and the concerns, I think, and the legitimate concerns a lot of times that those bring up, but then balancing, we kind of balance the public interest versus the property interest. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. uh, so our second question is, why are you interested in serving on the ZBA? And we'll start this question with Bob. Um, I believe in democracy and citizen participation. <clears throat> and um, ever since I came to Amherst, I've been active in town governance. And um, so I consider this another way of uh, contributing to the governance of our town. And I would be happy to do it. Thanks. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, Keith. Okay, hello. Um, I think working on, with on the ZBA is, uh, I think it's in a sense, it's being an advocate for the people of Amherst. Um, I think we, we can help the people of Amherst by following the rules of zoning, zoning laid out in the bylaws and the master plan. Um, I think it's also important to understand that, as Mark Parent has said many times, we're not here to make the laws, we're to interpret them, to, to put them into play. However, we need to do that in a way that is beneficial to both sides. And the more we make uh, conditions uh, on each uh, process that comes up, each application, the more we can control that without making new laws. Um, also, I, I find it uh, educational and informative to, uh, to work uh, with this. And, uh, uh, and I've had uh, seven years of service on the ZBA. And uh, I think it's, uh, in, it's, an, it's a very important aspect to the growth of Amherst. Hey, thank you, Keith. Uh, Dylan. So when um, 
in preparation for this, I had uh, listened to the, the audio recordings of some of the ZBA meetings to make sure I was in fact interested in the work that the ZBA would be doing. And uh, you know, what really stands out to me about the ZBA where, first of all, you know, I'd like to serve uh, the town of Amherst and I'm trying to think what the best way to do that was, the ZBA kind of jumps out at me because they aren't ones who make the laws. It's, it's ones who has to hear cases and has to interpret the laws. And it's something that requires coming with an open mind and comes in uh, with sound judgment, um, the ability to ask the right questions and to uh, provide um, the town of Amherst in, in this way that I, I really find compelling. And in reading some of the, the cases that have gone before the ZBA in the past, uh, you know, I was looking at a case from 2002, so quite a while ago, but one where it was um, for low income housing on um, 116 that the ZBA had voted unanimously to grant a uh, comprehensive permit because of the need for low income housing, where at the time it was 870 families on the waiting list. And it was a six year waiting period on average. This was something that had come before the ZBA. So not only is there you know, the opportunity of you know, the day to day that the ZBA deals with, but, but sometimes very interesting. And, and in this case, you know, rewarding cases that can come before the ZBA that I find it a very compelling board to work with. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, Craig Meadows. Uh, as a one of those long-term residents of Amherst, I've uh, been on town meeting and chaired another committee here in town, uh, and found uh, that the the ZBA is one of the more insightful, interesting, and uh, useful committees in town. One that has a great deal to do with with the way that the town moves forward and uh, interacts with a lot of our business owners uh, in addition to the, the university and the two colleges. Um, it's a committee that I'd be very interested in being on uh, because it, it has a lot to offer the town. And uh, again, as was said, it doesn't interpret, it's an interpretation of the law uh, and a decision-making body that that deals with, again, those gray areas that are so often uh, dominating the, the commercial spaces that, that uh, are unfolding here in town and look like they're going to continue for some time. Great, thank you, Craig. Tammy. Um, all right, well, um, I'm interested because I think it's important to do one civic duty whenever possible. And so I try to take on what I can manage and I've enjoyed being on the ZBA. Um, I do have an interest and a background in real estate and I do like the intricacies of zoning law. Um, I've been an alternate uh, for the past year and, um, and it's always interesting. I always learn something new. There's so many expect, unexpected uh, incidents that come up. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot that you need to know to do the job, but there's uh, 10 times more that you don't know that you need to know that you find out later. Um, I've been, um, I think I've served on uh, eight or nine of the meetings of the 17 sessions. Um, but I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, one thing that Sharon brought up was about the special permit and in relation to rental properties and why that's so important and how we can use special permits to, uh, protects neighbors in ways that I don't know if that happened in the past, but um, the way that it's been happening at the for the last year has been really useful in getting um, rental properties, uh, you know, to work in the neighborhoods that they're in. Um, so for me, it's, uh, believe it or not, it's fun for me. It's always interesting. Um, and there's something to learn every day. Thank you, Tammy. And Sharon. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I did it the hard way. Um, I really, I came to the ZBA because I was originally interested in kind of the goings on with the schools and rebuilding the schools because I have a couple of kids school age. And so that's kind of how I ended up 
at the ZBA, I guess I went on the website and checked a bunch of boxes um, and they called me and I was quite surprised. But um, I'm a lawyer by trade, so it's interesting to me for that reason, um, you know, in a way that you apply the laws. But I have really learned a lot over uh, the last year about applying those laws uh, fairly and in a way that you try to make it a win-win for everybody. That doesn't always happen, of course, but, um, you know, and, and a lot of times the law is dealing with pretty negative circumstances or people reacting negatively to a situation. It's been really interesting to try to kind of ferret out uh, answers to people's concerns, you know, before they've had a chance to talk to, say, the property owner. And I think sometimes when we get uh, letters, like from community members, you know, I always try to make sure I go through those because I want those people's concerns addressed. So I think that's, it's a good way for people to feel like they've participated. And I hope um, even when neighbors are disappointed, perhaps, that we have decided that people are allowed to do permits that they may not want to have happen in their neighborhood. Um, I do feel like we've given some protections and special permit conditions that will hopefully really assist the neighbors in the future and going forward. Because it is, it's a tough thing for people to have growth in their neighborhoods and, and feel a little tighter than they ever have. You know, but I feel it, it's really been interesting applying the laws that the town comes up with, um, you know, and people decide, well, this is what we're going to do. The master plan says we're going to do infill. So then we're there to try to make that as painless as possible. So that's been, it's been really interesting. Great. Thank you, Sharon. And Peter. So make sure you're unmuted. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in doing something to serve the town and try to be helpful to the town. Uh, I've lived in Amherst since 1997. I've lived in the Valley since 1990. Uh, I've known Amherst since I was an undergraduate at Amherst College in the late 1950s, and I'm very fond of the place. Uh, I have not served uh, in town government before this. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, I got active in lobbying about the replacing the bridge on Station Road. I was doing something which served my own interest, though I also thought it was in the interest of the town to put in a temporary bridge. But that got me thinking that it was time for me to do something not for my own interest, but for the town's interest. Uh, I. In the, during the course of my career, I've had lots of experience at working with small groups, chairing committees, uh, uh, as a college administrator and faculty member. Uh, I'm pretty good at it. Uh, I like working collaboratively with people. I like learning new things. Uh, so though, though I don't bring the specific experience uh, with zoning issues that some other people in this group do, uh, I think I have uh, the kinds of skills that could help make the board work together more effectively uh, and would welcome the opportunity to do that, the interest of helping the town. Great, thank you, Peter. So our next question is, describe a situation where you disagreed with a rule or regulation that had to apply it or follow it. And for this question, we'll begin with Keith. Okay, am I on? Good, thanks. Um, uh, when I was on the board, uh, we heard a petition for a new restaurant that, that was going to inhabit the building where Batucci's had been. Um, and they wanted to string several hundred bare bulbs over the patio areas. Well, I thought this was a violation of the downcast lights provision in the bylaws. I voted against uh, the use of those lights, but I then ultimately voted for the permit. Um, as the only board member who was opposed to those lights, I felt that I could not let that stand in the way of my voting for the permit. Um, Evan, do you still see me? Evan? 
I'm looking at Peter. Yeah, sorry, my screen br briefly froze, but I'm back. Okay, have you heard what I said or should I go back? Uh, I heard, I, I think I probably missed just a few seconds of it. Okay. Um, well, on the board, we were dealing with the restaurant that was going to take over the Bertucci's uh, uh, building and they wanted to string. I'm now looking at Sarah, who's not there. <laughs> it's good. You can still hear you. Okay. Can you can you hear me? And can the members of the can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Hear you. I, I've been able to hear you I all along. Disappearing. So I don't know who I'm talking to. And now I'm talking to Peter. <laughs> if you if you go up into the upper right of your screen, you should be able to do gallery view. And that yeah. should show you everyone. But we can hear you. Okay. Uh, it's just that if you keep disappearing, I don't know if I'm talking to you or not. Okay. Hopefully I'll hopefully uh, stay in your screen. Okay. I'm going to start again. That's okay. Okay. When I was on the board, we heard a petition for a new restaurant that to inhabit the building where Batucci's had been. And they wanted to string several hundred bare lights over the uh, pat uh, patio areas. I thought this to be a violation of the downcast lights provision in the bylaws. And I voted against the use of these lights, but I then voted for the permit because I was the only board member who was against the use of these lights. And I felt that I could not stand in the way of voting for the permit. The term downcast lights is a very vague one. I mean, floodlights have been allowed if they were trained toward the ground, but they're floodlights. And so there are many alternatives to this. This led me to making a full presentation at an executive meeting on the Z of the ZBA on the necessity and importance of dark sky compliant outdoor lighting uh, for all future projects. It, it is, I believe, has been found into 10.38 um, that now all outdoor lighting for any uh, application needs to be downcast and dark sky compliant lighting, which is very different from just downcast lighting. Anyway, so this is a point where I disagreed, but I uh, went ahead along with the, uh, the overarching uh, permit. Great, thank you, Keith. Uh, Dylan. So uh, what came to mind for me in reading this question was uh, several years ago when I was working at a, a company that I, I won't mention the name of, uh, when I first started there, uh, one of the things that we would need to do is, was uh, an IT role and we had salespeople who would work remote and like everybody else, every four years, we'd replace them with a new machine. And our policy for when setting up these new machines, we first had to log on as that person onto the machine to essentially set everything up for them. And the way that we were going about doing this is we would call that person, tell them we're setting up their machine and then ask them for what their password was so we could log onto the machine as them on our network. Um, then in IT, usually it's a, a big security risk to set the precedent that you ask someone for what their password is because you don't want that people giving that information out over the phone. But as I was the new person there, I uh, decided I'd, I'd come in, I'd, I'd go with that policy of, of how we were doing it, um, you know, really while I was learning what was going on. While I was there and my time there, and I, I learned you know, more about what our systems were, how we did things, um, I had found a different way or a different approach that we could, we could implement 
And uh, this was essentially by just resetting their password and then telling them, hey, we changed it. Here's your new password. And I had gone through uh, to make sure that that would work. And then I brought it to my manager to say, hey, I think the way we're doing it poses a security risk. Um, here's an alternative that gets the same effect, uh, but doesn't have that same security flaw. So in this way, when I came on, I had applied the rule and the method that we were using until I had a better understanding of the system. And I had gone through the proper channels of going to my manager and saying, hey, here's a new way I think we can implement it, implement it. And then with that approval, we had that rule changed. Thank you, Dylan. Craig. Well, I, I unfortunately deal with this almost every day. Uh, primarily because we do work for the federal government and the number of things that I don't agree with are enormous, but um, it, 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 and sometimes very inane, but that's aside from that fact, um, we, uh, I can give you an instance, we, we for many years, the HUD has a regulation that when you do uh, what's an energy performance contract for a housing authority, you cannot meld the uh, housing authority's offices in with the residential spaces uh, in reducing down their energy consumption. So for many years, what we did was we, we did not do that. We extracted the amount of use that was for the, even though the, the offices might be in the same building, we discounted that use out of it. Only to find out later on that uh, actually HUD doesn't follow their own rules and allows housing authorities to go ahead and, and, and utilize uh, the services for their, their administrative offices. Um, so it, it's interesting to find out the federal government's lack of logic as they're, they're doing things. I'm assuming that the town of Amherst certainly wouldn't do the same thing. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Tammy. All right, so um, this happens at work um, quite often. I can think of what I consider to be better ways to do things, but of course, you know, I just kind of, I, I'm, I'm always willing to try something new and I'm all, always willing to go along with uh, someone else's way just to see if it works. Um, in regards to zoning, um, there's lots of issues that I um, am concerned about. And so I do, um, tend to call the planning board a lot and I talk to Rob Mora a lot to kind of talk about what the history of the situation is or uh, you know looking at weighing the alter alternatives. Um, one issue was um, a, a curb cut uh, that's being planned on Route 9 for Coley Dickinson and I have a lot of concerns about a curb cut on Route 9 um, you know near uh, University Drive. Um, but I also understand the value of it. And so, you know, in our discussions, um, we came up with ways to prevent left, turn, uh, left turns going out and right turn, no, whatever it is. Uh, you know, we, we were working on the traffic patterns. Um, so um, I, I think that I will give my two cents, but I'm always willing to listen to uh, what others had to say and kind of weigh uh, what's gonna work best in the end. Thank you, Tammy. Sharon? Can't hear you, Sharon. Clicking the wrong button. Sorry. Thank you, Tammy. Um, you know, I didn't think of a specific instance. I haven't been able to come up with one, but I think everyone gave really good answers. And I think during my life, I've definitely realized, you know, I think when you're younger, you want to follow rules less, and I think that's pretty natural. Um, and then I think as you get older, you start realizing the usefulness of rules and regulations, um, you know, because I think they can make communities work better and more smoothly as a group, because you have to consider not the, either your self-interest or the interests of one particular group or another, or even one particular property owner. Um, you know, and I think the rules and regulations are supposed to be watching out for the health and safety of all the group and kind of the group interest and 
it's true that sometimes that then kind of nips the more unique um you know members of our community in the bud or or interesting uh you know different inter interesting ideas that may kind of rub against the grain um but what i think has been really interesting and i have learned more to do this because one because it's kind of required that's how the meetings operate you have to kind of hear what the proposal is and then listen to everybody's concerns and they all get a chance and frankly i haven't been to a really rowdy meeting so um you know i haven't got to watch that but uh you know i think we've done a really good job of addressing those concerns that i you know so i think we kind of try to find that balance of of the unique interest you know versus the the public interest so i think that's it makes it work better great thank you sharon peter just unmute. I will do a better job unmuted than muted of giving you examples from my work life. Uh, I've been much involved as a department chair and dean and faculty member in faculty hiring. And when you're working with colleagues, interviewing, reading dossiers, interviewing candidates, making decisions about who to offer a job to, uh, sometimes not everyone agrees. Uh, and uh, I have often found myself on the, the, the winning side in these, but sometimes on the losing side. Uh, and when that happens, uh, if the department makes an offer and the person joins, becomes your colleague, your responsibility, my responsibility is to <clears throat> do everything I can to help that person succeed. <clears throat> and and, and I, I think I have done that. Uh, the something similar happens uh, in making tenure decisions you know the different that's the, on a college faculty if, if a person doesn't get tenure they have to leave if they do get tenure they have virtually a lifetime appointment uh, so it's a very high stakes decision and again uh, the groups making those decisions don't always agree i have sometimes found myself uh, on the losing side in this uh, and you still have to continue to work with your colleagues for the future and so you do it uh it's that that's that's your job uh two more examples uh one of the things that i have cared most about in my academic career is uh the avail is need blind admissions uh i've worked at expensive colleges where it, it seemed to me an, an ethical necessity uh to make admissions available to anyone whether or not the families could afford to pay uh, when i came to mount holyoke the college had need blind admissions uh, when a new president came in uh, she felt the college's budgetary situation was such that the college couldn't afford to do it any longer uh, i was responsible at that point for overseeing the admissions office it was my responsibility to make sure that a policy of need sensitive admissions served succeeded and worked for the college even though it was not a policy that i myself uh, would have chosen or, or, or approved of uh, so i've i've had a good deal of experience uh, at uh, working with people uh, where sometimes my own view didn't prevail but nonetheless it was possible to continue on uh, and trying to make the institution work thank you peter and bob um whoops now you're muted here you okay. go there we go um so uh like sharon i couldn't think of anything until peter just spoke and so i have i don't know a small example uh, the way in, uh, in, in at Holyoke Community College where I work, the way the interview process is done for new hires, I don't quite agree with it. I think it's way too strict. I understand why they do it that way, but I don't agree with it, but I obviously work within it. I think, as I understand the spirit of this question is, as a member of the CBA, we may deal with zoning bylaws we don't like but have to uh, <laughs> abide by them because that's the law. I don't think I'll have a problem with that. Thank you, Bob. Okay, our next question is, tell us about an experience you have had collaborating with a group. And for this question, we'll begin with Dylan. So um, 
I think one of the biggest group projects I've ever done in my career, this was when I was working at uh, Synovian Pharmaceuticals a couple of years back. Um, and I'll keep my technical jargon here to, to a minimum, but I had worked in a, a server room, which is, um, for those who don't know, a server room is essentially a giant uh, temperature humidity controlled room where it stores these large computers called servers, which usually host a lot of the uh, data companies use through their day to day. And what we were doing was as we were updating these servers, some of them, the older ones were these giant machines that would weigh 400 pounds to these smaller ones that maybe weighed 50 pounds but were 10 times more powerful. We were consolidating the space um, to essentially make everything uh, much smaller, much more compact so we could uh, reuse that space. But in this project, we had um, all these different servers uh, involved different departments that were utilizing them and were utilizing them in the day to day. Some of these things we weren't entirely sure what was on them, how they were being utilized. So for this project, what I really had to do was, and I was lead on this project, was first working with uh, interdepartmental uh, within IT, you know, working with, with my network team, with my Windows team, trying to find out who manages what, what's on what servers. Um, and then from there, really having to work across departments of you know, we find out what what servers being used for now we have to coordinate with uh with legal or with hr to see hey what's on here can we shut this down can we migrate you what's the time that we can do this at um and this project really required a a, a great deal of patience as coordinating over many months with many different people uh definitely took took a lot of time and a lot of uh, a lot of effort to get that done in there and then additionally in that, um, in the early stages of the planning phases, you know, one of the, one of the big things uh, we really had to deal with was what is the best approach for a lot of these things? I know one of the examples we had on um, some of these old servers from when our company was a different company before it had been acquired. And we had to try to make that decision. Is this something that we save? indefinitely is this something that we make the decision on now of how do we want to handle this old data really what the way to do this was and it really required a lot of inter uh, departmental discussion about how we want to to go about this and i can't really say that 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 um process was contentious in any way but it was was definitely very thoughtful with um different approaches of of, of how we should do it that we really had to to sit and discuss what the best way forward was before moving forward in, in such a way that we could move fluidly and um, and smoothly throughout the whole process to actually actually get this um, process done. Thank you, Dylan. Craig? Uh, I basically deal with groups every day. Um, our Projects for the uh, VA entail groups of 12 to 15 people who meet sometimes every uh, two, twice a week, sometimes once every other week. Um, there, it's a collaborative effort in which everybody has to get to the point where they're agreeing on what the next steps are going to be um, and how we're going to deal with the uh, analysis, the construction, the hiring, et cetera. So uh, there are collaborative efforts that, that I'm involved with constantly, and uh, I don't see anything reducing that in the future. Great. Thank you, Craig. Tammy? Um, all right. Uh, well, at Hampshire College, um, I joined the community outreach group. It's a subset of Hampshire's revisioning group. I don't know if people know about Hampshire College, but <laughs> we, we've had a, a very interesting couple of years there. Um, anyway, we had two factions on campus, um, and it was quite contentious uh, for a while. Uh, but our group was tasked with figuring out a way to bring the two sides together to help save Hampshire and to get all on the same page. And so what we did was we had some forums where we were discussing different points of view. Um, of course, diplomacy and, and uh, tact are very important. Uh, we, we were focused on uh, forgiving the past and trying to plan a future. Um, through that process, um, what I 
came to understand is it's really important to speak up, but to keep your comments brief and on point. It's important to listen with an open mind. Um, and at Hampshire and in other places that I've worked, I've been on lots of different committees, employee searches and forums, precinct groups, division meetings, and things like that. Done. Thank you, Tammy. Sharon? <laughs> I'm just getting good at that, not. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is definitely an interesting new meeting format. So um, I work with, I work now in child welfare law. I've also done criminal law and family law. Um, and I really rely, we have a group of attorneys, all of us that kind of rotate through representing either a parent or a child or some other party in a child welfare case. Um, and what's been really interesting is there are definitely some very strong personalities. Um, but I've really learned by listening to all the different sides, like I've learned a lot from different um, people that have different levels of experience. Um, and now I'm becoming a little more of one of the more experienced ones. So people are coming to me, which I find really interesting. <laughs> I'm not used to that. Um, but I, I find that, that kind of the other interesting thing about it is that any given on any given day in any given case we may represent either a parent or a child or say a grandparent or guardian someone with a different interest and i may in any given day have 10 cases on so i could i could be many i have many hats on you know given given uh whatever cases i'm on that particular day and what's to me what's really interesting is that i have really learned that my perspective can shift from case to case to case but i've really learned also some to like, I think soften the strength of some of my opinions because I may have one case where I represent a parent and I don't like what's happening to them. And then in the very next case, you know, within the hour, I go in on a different case where I represent the child and that same thing is happening to the other parent and I don't represent that parent. So, um, but like, it's just been really so interesting with that um, to temper kind of the that everything is one way all the time thinking um, that I think can sometimes crop up. Um, and then it's just really useful to collaborate, even with people who are, I, are very difficult to get along with for a lot of people. I have learned to kind of make peace with them and because I learned so much from them, even if they have a difficult personality. Like I'm thinking of one attorney in general, in specific, who, who has a very difficult personality, but is sharp as a whip. So I love to go ask her uh, questions, even though I may have to deal with some challenging uh, personality types uh, from her and from plenty of others, trust me, we're all pretty colorful group. Um, but I really find that I learn a lot and whether or not I use every single piece of what everybody told me, it's definitely interesting to get kind of a wide variety of perspectives and then remembering all the different roles I've had in different cases to kind of move forward in, in a, you know, a balanced and fair way as best I can. Thank you, Sharon. Peter. <clears throat> I want congratulations for remembering to unmute myself without being reminded. Uh, I spent my career uh, as a teacher and scholar and academic administrator. Uh, and the, the teacher scholar part of that work is pretty solitary I and mean, it sounds like a strange thing to say about teaching because you're with students, but you, you are making all the decisions about what happens in that classroom. Uh, I was drawn to administrative work because I like working collaboratively. Uh, I like uh, thinking something through in conversation with other people. I like finding out what someone else thinks and letting that modify my own thinking. Uh, uh, and I've done that in many, many settings uh, as, as a committee member and committee chair uh, in, in the course of my, my, my teaching work, uh, as dean of faculty and provost at Mount Holyoke. Uh, academic decision making is, is rarely top down. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's almost always collegial. Uh, and I take great pleasure uh, in uh, helping a group find a consensus 
uh, and reach agreement about a subject, uh, not necessarily coming out exactly where I would have, uh, often coming out someplace better than I would have by myself. Uh, and to me, it's, a, it's really satisfying to feel that uh, I have helped people use their best selves to collectively achieve something that they might not have been able to achieve individually. Thank you, Peter. Bob? Yeah, so um, I'm another academic. <laughs> and so I'm on all kinds of committees all the time. I think the biggest split that in my experience in academia is the division between administration and faculty. And it's always been my goal to um, make that work as good as possible because we're all part of the same community and it just makes us more effective and productive and improves the quality of everyone's life if we get along with each other, listen to each other, and collaborate well with each other. So I like being on committees that are well balanced between administrators and faculty. Thank you, Bob. And Craig, uh, Keith, sorry, Keith. Okay. Um, I've been a professional actor and director for over 40 years in theater and film, and they are very collaborative arts. Uh, they, in fact, do not thrive without uh, collaboration. And especially as a director, I'm in charge of the overall aspects of the production, and I have to incorporate and collaborate with uh, scenic, lighting, costume, sound, properties, designers, as well as working with the actors on the performance. And then as a member of the board of the ZBA, uh, I served as an alternate, alter, uh, alternate, excuse me, and then as a full member. And I chaired several meetings and hearings, uh, including the one with uh, Aspen, Aspen Apartments, and uh, which took four months of meetings to reach the vote to permit. And I worked hard to make sure that the project met our standards of the town of Amherst and was acceptable to the abutting public, those people who live around that uh, project. Um, and among other measures that we got, we had over like 120 conditions on that uh, 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 on that uh, project. We got it from a four-story building down to a two-story building. Um, I think it's important to understand that the ZBA has a responsibility and a mission to make sure that whatever application we're dealing with stands by and lives by the rules of the town of Amherst and the state um, and that it can integrate into the surrounding neighborhoods. We have some glaring examples in this town where that didn't happen, but we have many more over the last several years where it has happened. Um, and I think that's important to, to make sure that we understand that that's, that's, I think the thrust of the ZBA is to make sure that that happens. Thank you, Keith. And so we have one final question, which is, what else would you like us to know about you that makes you a strong candidate for the ZBA? And for this one, we will start with Craig. Well, for the last 50 years that I've been in town, um, I've seen the transitions that have taken place, not just as far as the buildings are concerned, but 
in the attitudes in town that have um, resulted in a, a number of changes that one wouldn't have expected 45 or 50 years ago. And it's interesting to me that um, in many regards, the ZBA reflects the changes in attitudes at the same time. Um, there may not have in many regards been significant changes in, uh, in the zoning. There may not have been significant changes in what the town plans have done. There have been minor um, maneuvers, or I shouldn't say, that's not an appropriate word, minor, minor variations on what uh, a lot of what has occurred in town. But attitudes have changed, I think, considerably. And the reflection of that um, is something I think that needs to be taken into account whenever you're, you're examining and need to examine um, some of the things that the ZBA does. As a consequence, um, my children have got different, who live in town, who grew up here, went to school here, and live here now, and their children have got different attitudes than I do, certainly. And um, I hear those things from them that I may not agree with, but realize that, that uh, not only do I have to change, but the town is changing in, con in conjunction with them. So I see all of our gray hair here. Um, <laughs> yours, yours is not. <laughs> but it's reflected elsewhere. Uh, and I, I think we have to reflect as we move along on what the younger and non-gray-haired people really want for the town going forward. Thank you, Craig. Tammy. All right, well, I'm currently serving as an alternate and I've had fun with that. Um, I was a town meeting uh, member. I participated in the master plan focus groups. I'm also a voting warden. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters and I go to a lot of, I have gone to a lot of town committee meetings. Um, my husband, Philip, and I have uh, bought and or sold six properties and we've done a lot of modifications, which, we, which means that we've done a lot of zoning law research. Uh, he is a real estate attorney and I've taken a lot, I've taken real estate courses. Um, I am uh, neutral in regard to town politics and I'm not aligned with any particular agenda. And I'm comfortable with the open meeting format. Although I don't love public speaking, I don't mind the uh, discussion part of it. Um, and I'm just happy to continue serving on the committee. Thank you, Tammy. Sharon. Dang, I got beat by all the gray hairs on <laughs> unmuting before getting reminded. Um, so what's been really interesting to me is that during my tenure as an associate member, my family and I moved into kind of a historic neighborhood that hugs right up against UMass. So that's kind of an interesting, it's been an interesting change. I used to live in South Amherst, far away from the matting crowds of downtown and, and UMass, and now we're just right in the thick of it. So certainly um, it's a pretty active neighborhood that I live in. I get, um, there's, there's a monthly brunch and uh, lots of folks will come around and, um, well, before <laughs> the social distancing and, um, I don't know, we get little newsy emails and, and it, it is really interesting to kind of watch a neighborhood. You know, I don't think I had as much information before, but watch a neighborhood kind of squirm in the right in the sights of something that one brings the town, you know, a lot of revenue, but also can create a lot of a lot of uh, friction. So it's been interesting to me to try to help um, you know, soften the blow and soften that friction at least as best as we can as the ZBA, you know, by coming up with creative uh, 
special permit conditions and and it's certainly not you know like much of the law it's not particularly positive although i must say there was one recently that we said that i sat on um and all the comments were positive and i was just i was just about shocked and my had to scoop my chin up off the floor but i very much enjoyed that but what was interesting about it is I, as much as i loved all the positive comments because i did um, they came in person. We had some negative comments by letter, and um, that was kind of the one that I was referring to before, where I brought up her concerns because she wasn't able to make it to the meeting. So I almost felt like the ruiner, but um, it was it was it was interesting, and I I think we got her concerns met, and I didn't. We don't have a lot of. Um, what's interesting is we we don't have a lot of collaboration when we're doing this work. I mean, it's pretty individual. We don't have a lot of we don't have any time to talk about our ideas about things until we're sitting right there in the public so that's been an interesting lesson too it's not it's, you don't sit behind at least on this board you certainly do not sit behind closed doors and and even talk about things or even out in public when we're you know getting tours of places and we have to remember to ask our questions um right then and there and then try to remember them later the questions that we ask and have all your discussion right there for everyone to see. So it's been really interesting. Great, thank you, Sharon. Peter. Let me try to make two different points. Uh, one which I've made before uh, is that I think what I have to offer to the ZBA uh, is uh, an ability to help groups work together and re reach a, a common goal uh, in a collaborative way. This is something that I've done through a long career. Uh, I'm good at it. Uh, and uh, I think I could play that role constructively uh, on the ZBA as I learned some of the things that other people in this, I was gonna say in this room, other people in this Zoom, uh, know from their own experience having already served on the board. The other thing is to say that it, as I listen to our conversation tonight, it sounds as though one of the things that the ZBA does is to try to strike a kind of balance between uh, the past and the future uh, as, the, as the town evolves. That's also something that I take some pride in having done in the course of my career. Uh, you know, in the early 1960s, uh, uh, I was involved in uh, bringing the study of film into the Williams College curriculum. It had never been there before. Uh, I taught uh, in also in the, uh, in the late 1960s, the first course in African American literature at Williams College. Uh, this was something that uh, was just merely becoming uh, a subject of academic study. It's now uh, a field so important that my younger colleagues can scarcely imagine that there was a time uh, when it wasn't important. Uh, similarly, uh, I re remade myself uh, as a feminist critic uh, in the uh, late 1980s and 1990s uh, as I realized the, the power of gender uh, to shape the way we study literature. My point being uh, not to, to pat myself on the back for what I have done in my career as a teacher and scholar, but just to say that uh, part of the, the what I've uh, relished in that career is uh, helping along a steady evolution from the way things were then to the way things should be in the future. Uh, and that strikes me as something uh, that being on the ZBA might help me do for the town. Great, thank you, Peter. Bob? So I, I don't have the gray hair problem, I have the no hair problem. <laughs> so I'm in a category by myself here. Um, I'm going to unmute myself and say that you should not take so much pride in being in, in, in having no hair. You've got company also with the gray haired side of it. Anyway, I think I um, would be a good candidate for the CBA, but <clears throat> um, truthfully, I, I have to say this. This is a, 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 maybe a little, I hope it's not out of order. Uh, I think uh, everyone here is well qualified and I don't feel like I'm so needed here 
And I'm really also, as you know, uh, Evan and others on the committee, I'm interested in the planning board. And I feel like if I get appointed to the DBA, um, I, I think I'm, I'm going to withdraw my application and save that to be able to apply to the planning board because I'm quite impressed with all the candidates here and I think there's more than enough qualified candidates for all the positions that are needed. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Keith? Okay. Uh, you know what's interesting to me is that a lot of the, I mean, not a lot, but a couple of the questions that have been asked of all of us are about collaboration. Uh, how good are we at collaboration? Uh, when in fact, when you're on the ZBA, you are not allowed to speak to anybody else on the ZBA board about anything that's coming up. You, you can only show up at the public hearings and or meetings, and then you have to, through your understanding of what's in front of you and the bylaws, uh, come to an agreement with those on the board. Um, and one of the things that I've learned over the period of time is that there is a huge, there can be a huge volume of material that one has to go through to not only understand the bylaws and the 10.38, uh, but the, uh, the, the many uh, possibilities of what can be done within those bylaws. And you have to understand that when you walk in that room, given what the proposals are in front of you. Which means being on the ZBA is about doing a lot of research. I personally like to do research. I mean, it's one of the aspects I, under, I, I like most about acting and directing. As an example, the last play I directed was uh, The Diary of Anna Frank uh, with Silverthorne Theater in Greenfield. I spent four months researching all the aspects of the lives of those in that annex in Amsterdam, the war years, the outside events, and how they, uh, 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 impacted uh, the people in there, the customs, the religious ceremonies of the Jewish faith, and, and much, much more. It's, all this work supported my collaboration with the designers and actors. But on the ZBA, you have to walk into the room with all of that. You can't do it with them, except in executive meetings. And in my experience, that happens once or maybe twice a year. Um, so uh, I think that's incredibly important to, be, to understand that that is an aspect that is demanded of you if you are a member of the ZBA. Um, and as I said, I, I spent some years on, on the board and I've done that with Mark Parent, who, uh, and he has taught me to further the value of the qualities that he outlined in his email uh, under the selection guide that was sent to us. Um, I believe they're incredibly important. Um, and my time with him I, I, was invaluable for me. And I think that uh, he has given us a roadmap for uh, the path for the ZBA. There we go. Great. Thank you, Keith. And uh, finally, Dylan. So I, um, 
you know, I've lived in a lot of different places, especially in Massachusetts, lived all over Metro West, uh, Hopkinton, Framingham, Millis, to name a few. Recently, I was even living in a college town outside of Cincinnati, um, in Oxford, Ohio. And it's something that you realize is, or something that I've realized is, is Amherst is really a special place. Um, I think everybody here would probably agree with that. And I also think that, uh, what that specialness is, is um, you're going to be different for, for different people. And I think you know, coming into the ZBA and yeah, as Amherst is changing uh, over the years, trying to really strike a balance to, to keep, um, to keep Amherst and what it is people love about Amherst to, to keep that intact is, um, is something important to do. And you know, as far as the ZBA is concerned, you know, it's something I want to bring uh, that, that kind of attitude, that kind of open-mindedness, that thoughtfulness is something that I, I want to bring to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I, uh, you know, furthermore, I'm somebody who has been very interested in local government. I, I ran for council, uh, council uh, a few years ago. I think I've demonstrated that I am very comfortable speaking and working in front of the public. Uh, I'm familiar with our zoning bylaws, our open meeting laws. Uh, I've read through the master plan. I know a little bit about the process that went into that. And, um, you know, I'm somebody who is comfortable being able to rely on the expertise of, the, of our staff. We're also being comfortable to, to ask you know, good questions of our staff when it comes up. And I think that I bring uh, a good temperament and bring good judgment to the ZBA as well. Great, thank you, Dylan. So that is all of our questions. So I wanna first thank all of you uh, for being here with us tonight. I wanna thank you for accommodating this new uh, public meeting via Zoom reality, which is not without complication. And I wanna thank you for your willingness to serve uh, our community on the ZBA. I am going to adjourn this meeting. Uh, the members of VOCA will take a brief break um, and then this committee uh, will reconvene. Uh, if any of the interviewees want to stick around, I will be moving you to, from panelists um, to attendees, but you are also welcome to recognize that it's nearly nine o'clock and perhaps you wanna do other things with your night. Uh, so with that, I am going to adjourn this meeting and I am going to call Oka back to order at 9 p.m. Thank you. So this Thank meeting you. is adjourned at 8.52 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Are we here, Oka? I see George. We should probably all say that we're here. Yeah. Uh, Darcy is not here. George is here. Sure. Yeah. Um, here. Okay. George is eating his orange, too. Mm. <laughs> I almost I almost grabbed one, uh, but I didn't want to get juice all over my face. <laughs> As I'm on public at 9 p.m. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where Darcy went. She was. I don't know if she left. I, I was only paying attention to the interviewees, so I wasn't watching, no offense to y'all, but I wasn't watching any of y'all's <laughs> uh, pictures during that meeting. I was trying to focus just on the interviews, so I don't know if she was there for the whole time. It looks like she disconnected or, you know, shut down or left the meeting, which... Do you think she was thinking that she had to come in on a different meeting if there was a different... Uh, yeah, I'm going to just shoot her a little text. Alrighty. Um, okay, so I texted her.
Okay, well, I, I have texted her to ask her if she intends to participate, um, but we do have a quorum. Um, so I think that hopefully she will respond and ideally join us, uh, but I am going uh, to move forward the discussion. So seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call the special meeting of the Committee on Outreach, Communications and Appointments to order at 9.02 p.m. I'm going to first just call the roll of the counselors here to make sure that everyone uh, can hear us and we can hear you. So start with Alyssa. Alyssa Brewer is present. Alyssa Brewer is in, God, I'm getting, it's getting late. Uh, Alyssa is here. Uh, I, I am here. Uh, George? I'm here, can hear you all. Okay, and Sarah? I am, I am here, I am present. Okay. Uh, Darcy has texted me back. Um, she said that she is planning on joining, but now I have the little dots, so she's currently texting. <laughs> um, so just to, um, sorry, just to structure this meeting, uh, I would like to do this the same way we did our deliberation meeting after the planning board, which is to say I would like us to start by looking at the selection guidance and I would like us to talk about what we heard uh, from candidates um, that we feel aligns with our selection guidance. So at this point, I do not want to hear uh, advocacy for any individual candidate or candidates. I think that uh, this committee can follow that rule. Um, and so instead of naming names of who you would like to see, I would like us to just talk about candidates um, with respect to the selection guidance. So I am going to uh, put that on our screen so we can all view it. So you all should be seeing my screen right now and should be seeing the selection guidance. Sarah. Sorry, Evan, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. So with reading over people's um, applications, um, I'm wondering if the two people that are associate members right now um, one of them, I believe, clearly stated that they were interested in being a full member, but I'm not sure about the other, and I'm not sure if there's a, a good way to answer that. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm so glad you asked that, because uh, there were two pieces of information that I thought were pertinent to this conversation that I made sure to ascertain uh, before this meeting. So one is I spoke individually to both Tammy Parks and to Sharon Waldman, both of whom are current associate members. Uh, Tammy Parks is very interested in moving up to a regular membership. Mm -hmm. Sharon Waldman is not at this point in time. So um, she said that she loves her work on the ZBA. She would like to continue on the ZBA and that she would, she thinks in the future, she might want to be a regular member, but at this time she would prefer remaining as an associate member. Thank you. Uh, this, <laughs> okay, and then the, uh, right, I should have said that at the outset, so thank you for asking that. Um, and then the second pertinent piece of information is we all received uh, literally like 10 minutes before the start of this meeting a uh, memo from the town manager regarding his, his board of license commissioner appointments. And you will have noticed that Dylan Maxfield um, has been appointed to the board of license commissioners pending town council approval. Uh, I reached out to Dylan literally minutes before the interview started after I read the town manager's memo and asked him if given his appointment to Board of License Commissioners, he was still interested in serving on the ZBA. And he said that he is interested in serving on the ZBA and does believe that he can have, uh, that he has the capacity um, and the time to serve on both bodies. Um, and so not, uh, I think he is hoping not to be disqualified from this body um, because of his appointment to Board of License Commissioners. So I think those are two pertinent pieces of information. Um, so what we have for the selection guidance um, is our criteria for a healthy multiple member body. Uh, in this case, I do think that there is some relevance to this in that um, we do have two members who have been serving who are up for reappointment. 
Um, and as um, we do have in 1C, generally if a person is serving a first term, they're giving preference for a second. Um, I think we should also recognize that Keith Langsdale had served on the ZBA for some period of time. Um, although this would not necessarily, uh, this would not be a, a continuous reappointment, um, but I do think it, there's still a lens to be uh, applied there. Uh, we're also looking at 1D, which is characteristics of effective ZBA members. We're looking for people who are open-minded, able to work in a collaborative spirit, openness to compromise, understanding the judicial function of the body, and then we have this fairly lengthy list of characteristics from the now former chair of the ZBA, but chair at the time that we asked for the input, uh, Mark Parent, uh, which is the same list that we also received last spring when we were going through these appointments uh, regarding different characteristics and qualities uh, that he believes uh, you would be looking for in a ZBA member. So the first conversation I would like to have is given um, what we heard in the interviews and given what we have voted on and adopted as our selection guidance, uh, where did you see um, candidate statements or candidates say things that you felt aligned with the selection guidance? So I will open the floor. If you're interested in talking, you can just raise your hand. Uh, Darcy. Darcy, you're muted. I just have a process question um, sure. about how we are going to, how the voting is going to work. That is a, a very good question. Um, so my hope is we can have this conversation and perhaps come to some uh, consensus about where we want to put at least some of the candidates. Um, I would like to be able to vote this as a package that we send to the council if we can come to consensus on which candidates to appoint and to which slots. Uh, if we cannot get to that point, um, then we will have individual votes on individual appointments. Um, but I would prefer that we first have a broader conversation about um, who we saw uh, aligning with the selection guidance and perhaps have a discussion that we can bring uh, to consensus around who we might be interested in appointing into where. George? Just in, in general, um, again, I felt the CAFs um, were not all that in, helpful to me. Um, I gleaned a few things, but the willingness of all these uh, folks to uh, go through this process, the interview process this evening, I think was, was valuable. Um, and I think I did learn, I certainly learned a lot more from listening to them respond to our questions. I thought our questions were generally effective. I, I will perhaps talk about, I'm sure we'll talk about this later uh, in regular session, but um, I got the impression that uh, all of the candidates that presented themselves this evening um, in, in broad sense uh, fit the criteria that we, um, we are looking for. Uh, particularly those listed under the input from the body's chair, uh, but also our own notion. Uh, they seemed open-minded. Um, the idea of collaborative uh, or collaboration is something everyone seemed to pick up on. I thought a, an excellent point was made that, um, that I want to keep in the back of my mind is the degree to which the work on this EBA, ZBA does require a, a fairly uh, heavy amount of research, a fairly heavy amount of, 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 of looking at detailed materials. Um, everyone seemed open to the spirit of compromise. Um, and everyone seemed quite aware of the, the judicial function of the body. So I personally did not hear anything uh, from the candidates and what they said this evening that raised any flags in those areas at all. Um, Thank you. Other comments on things that we heard that we felt aligned or I suppose also conflicted with our selection guidance. Sarah. Um, so I would say I agree with George. I thought that everybody really met our, you know, our general criteria. Um, as far as then, you know, talking about the balance of 
new people and experienced people. Um, so I feel like we had um, a, a nice amount, surprisingly a nice amount of people who have had experience and or who have served, um, which I think would be helpful to the ZBA right now as it stands and doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, experience. And um, so I felt good about that. And then definitely the, the people who, uh, with newer faces, I was also really impressed by um, their qualifications. So I, I feel like I sort of got a feeling of um, the general, general qualifications, and then us thinking about who would serve another term, who would be experienced, and then newer faces. So that, that definitely made sense to me, and I felt like we had a good representation there. Sorry, my screen shifted. I couldn't find my mute. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, Alyssa, Darcy, any comments with regard to uh, selection guidance? Darcy. Uh, yes, I, I, I guess I would agree with Sarah and George that um, I felt like everybody, I could envision all of the interviewees as uh, members of the of the board um, that they met the, our qualifications. Okay. I do. I do have a, a question. Um, am I still unmuted? Yep. Um, I do have um, a question about the assumption of a second term for someone who is um, an associate member. I assume that the assumption is for the same position. Um, so the fact that Tammy wants to move to the board, I'm just interested to know what people think the assumption means for her. She obviously has gained experience over the year, um, but do does she get assumption points <laughs> when she's moving up to from associate to the board? Um, I'm just wondering if anybody has ideas about that. Okay, I'll go to Alyssa first, then George. I don't know if this answers your question, Darcy, in terms of what you mean by points, um, because I think people sometimes read the assumption about a next term as a negative versus a positive versus just a piece of information. But having previously been part of the body for 12 years that appointed the ZBA, um, what we always worked with then was that when we had associates, we often, we had the same associate get reappointed for several one-year terms in a row, and eventually they rose to be a full member, just depending on who came and who went. As we've seen, there's been a huge turnover in the ZBA here. That has not always been true, right? It's like every other committee, it ebbs and flows. So it was very traditional to keep reappointing people to one-year terms, basically until they got to the point of saying, oh, look, there's now there's an opening for a full member. Um, and then they'd start getting three-year terms. But again, you know, that was then, this is now. And I think, and the other piece of information that you might remember me bringing up at OCA was asking Evan to, again, do some legwork for us to find out if Tammy and Sharon had actually had a chance to serve on any panels. And we found out tonight, based on both their really excellent um, answers to questions, that they have, in fact, both done that. Whereas in the past, if we found people who'd literally never served, it didn't make any sense to move them up to full member, even if maybe they'd been doing it longer, if they hadn't really been on any panels and had any experience with it. But on the other hand, since we do now have associates who have had experience, it wouldn't make any sense to me if any of them are interested in continuing and we think that they're good candidates, that we wouldn't promote them to full because they actually have had the experience. Whereas if we still had an associate who hadn't had any experience, then I would think that that would be roughly comparable to just the new person off the street who hadn't had any experience. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alyssa. George? I have to um, agree with Alyssa in the sense of um, the notion that um, the fact that one is an associate. Um, let's be honest here, we're looking at a body that's basically reduced now to two um, full members. And that's, uh, Alyssa can speak to this, she has the experience. Uh, maybe that's happened in the past with the ZBA and, um, and that's, they dealt with it. But um, this strikes me as obviously a very unusual situation. And if we have someone who has served already for a year, who expresses an interest in moving up and meets our other qualifications, um, that would seem to be a, a strong case for, 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 for moving that person along. If we had a full body of five full members, um, and this were, shall we say, a more normal, if there is such a thing, a more normal situation, then um, that person would probably be easily renewed as an associate. But this is not a normal situation. Um, and unless we're prepared to, I mean, we have to find some full members for this body, or it can't function. Um, and it seems like we have, uh, thankfully, a number of, of seemingly solid candidates and the question I think for us tonight is how, you know, how we're going to place them. Um, and certainly someone who has already served for a year and um, you know, seems more than willing to move along, move up, um, is a positive in this unusual circumstance. Other comments uh, with regard to, uh, yeah, Darcy. Um, I just have another, am I unmuted? Yes. Um, I just have another question about um, the uh, does any it, whether anyone is aware of when Keith um, Langsdale served and uh, because that was that was a little um, um, revelation when he said he had served for seven years. Um, so I just am interested to know if if anyone knows any more about that. I don't know the exact dates and I did look at his uh, CAF to see if, if they would be on there and it was not. Um, I don't know if Alyssa has more information. Uh, Sarah? I don't have it in front of me because I remembered when Keith was on CBA I, as a remembrance as opposed to a specific number of years. And I figured anybody that wanted to know that would just look it up. Sorry, it wasn't. Again, perhaps this is a reason why we need to ask more specific questions in a writing sample than on a CBA. <laughs> Sarah. So um, I'm the one that interviewed Keith uh, back early last fall when we did all of this the first time and he was serving then and i believe he had and i'm i'm spitballing this but i believe he had served like three years at that time consecutively and then i, I think that he had had like a year or two off and then had served previous to that um he was very interested um in continuing uh, to serve, although at that time he had said he would be willing to step down if a younger person wanted to come in. But um, I do know that he had worked very closely with Mark Parent and Mark Parent himself had said that he felt like Keith should be a person that, that was on as a full member. So that's just, he's got a lot of recent experience and he seems to be very well respected on the ZBA. Other thoughts or comments with regard to the selection guidance, uh, things you heard that you felt aligned well with the selection guidance? Okay, so seeing none, we will go to the uh, trickier part, I think, of the evening, which would be uh, how to put this puzzle together. Um, so, you all have, you should be seeing my screen now, you all have in your uh, packet this document. Um, you had a version of this document earlier in the week that looked slightly different because this document changed uh, midweek. Uh, and so this shows us the current landscape of the ZBA. And so of course, uh, 
Yes, Alyssa. I'm sorry, apparently I clicked too many times. I am not raising my hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so this shows the current landscape of the ZBA. So per our zoning bylaw, uh, our ZBA and our charter, our ZBA has five regular seats, three associate seats. Uh, last spring, we appointed five people as full members and we appointed three people as associate members. We left one associate seat vacant and my understanding is that that has been, even though we technically allow up to four associates, we have historically only appointed three associates. Um, and so we currently have uh, Steve Judge and Joan O'Mara continuing on the ZBA. Both of them, are uh, their terms are not up until 2022, but we do have these three vacancies of full members. And then of course we have uh, both Tammy and Sharon as associate members who are uh, technically up for reappointment um, at the end of June, and then we have these two um, vacant ones. And so I think where I would like to begin the conversation is here with the three vacant full members. Um, and so I'd like to open the floor to discussion about which of the candidates uh, you heard that you think would be suitable to put into one of these full member roles, and you can um, why don't we, you can talk about all three, or if you just say, this is definitely one person. Uh, so we'll start with Sarah. Sorry, it seems to be hard for me to find that on mute. So I'm going to give you three, and if that's okay, okay. and tell you why. Um, so it. Keith Langsdale, I think I already said um, how I felt about um, the, how long he has served and how well respected um, he is. So I would definitely put Keith in as a full member. Uh, Tammy Parks, I have been impressed with from the get go from when I met her um, last year. I think she works well with people. I think she's an independent thinker, but has a lot of flexibility. So I would also put her in as a full member. And as a third full member, I would pick uh, Dylan Maxfield because I think he had all the qualifications we were looking for. He is um, someone who's new right now to serving on boards here. And he's also a younger person. And we talked about the gray hairs and the non-gray hairs. <laughs> um, and I, I just think that that's a voice that um, I would like to see um, as a full member. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And I'm glad that this camera doesn't fully show my gray hairs, um, which are increasing <laughs> in number. I wonder rapidly. why, Evan. <laughs> uh, George, your hand is up. Uh, you are muted currently. How's that? Much better. All right. So for some reason, the uh, space bar didn't work. I don't know why, because I was, I keep wanting to thank Alyssa for mentioning that a number of meetings ago, because it's made my life much simpler. But there, for some reason, it didn't work. I apologize. I'd like to present uh, also three uh, candidates. I agree with Sarah about Keith. Um, for the reasons that she stated. I agree with her very much about Tammy um, Parks um, for all the reasons that she stated. Um, I too found her impressive this evening. I'm a little less ex uh, enthusiastic about Dylan, not because he doesn't have the qualifications by any means, by all means he does, but um, as we learned from Evan this evening, um, he is going to be put forward for the Board of License Commissioners. And I just personally have um, given the demands that the ZBA uh, can put on people, and given that this is a full member position, I have some serious concerns about anyone, I don't care how young or how old or how enthusiastic, uh, carrying on two fairly demanding positions. Board of License Commissioners um, also has uh, some serious duties it has to deal with. So I would be open to Dylan as an associate member, but I would be a little less excited about him as a, uh, a full member because of simply the sheer workload, uh, despite his obvious enthusiasm and saying that he thinks he can handle it, um, I would be reluctant to, to, to vote for that. But I do support uh, uh, Keith 
for his experience and that he would bring to a body that's now basically reduced to two. Um, and I think that Tammy uh, looks like she would be an excellent uh, addition to this body. Uh, my third uh, suggestion I, I'm not as strong about, I, I'm open to other ideas, but um, I think we're looking for someone who, who's willing to do research, someone who's willing to uh, you know, dig into a problem. Um, and I thought that maybe uh, Peter Barrick might fit that qualification. Um, of course, he doesn't bring youth, um, that's for sure. Um, but um, anyway, so those are my three at the moment. Um, two of them I'm very strong on. The third, uh, I'm willing to, to hear other arguments. Okay. Uh, Darcy or Alyssa, do you have uh, thoughts on uh, candidates that you think uh, you would support filling these three vacant full member roles? Yeah, I can go next. Um, uh, I do feel like um, that it isn't um, really, I, I support Dylan Maxfield, um, partly because he is, represents youth <laughs> and he's the only representative of youth in the whole group. And, um, you know, he's applied for a lot of different positions. And I think that if he feels that he can handle two, then we should honor that. Um, and especially if he would prefer to do this. I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but um, uh, I think he should be given the choice. Um, so I, I tend to not want to, even though Keith Langsdale has a lot of experience, the fact that he's already served seven years um, and we have a whole list of other people who are really interested in serving um, I am not really considering him because of that. Um, and I also think that um, uh, Tammy Parks would be good because of her experience and the fact that she's already done a year and, and she it would make sense if she wants to move up to move her up because she sounds like she is very knowledgeable. Um, and thirdly, I would, uh, yeah, I'm sort of torn between <laughs> two for the third position, but, um, I think that I would also go with, um, Peter Barrick because he seems like he is very, um, uh, you know, he would be very collaborative. It seems like he'd help a lot. He would be a quick study and be able to do um, a lot of the reading and research that's required um, and be up to speed very quickly. So I would say those three. Okay, thank you. And Alyssa. I'm stalling because I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, I think our, my support for Tammy is absolutely unequivocal. So that's great. That's easy. Um, I hear the concerns and I, I figured it would come up associated with Keith's service and the fact that he's already served for several years. So therefore, do we need him at this particular moment, right? I mean, it's never about not wanting someone. It's given what the particular circumstances we're in at any particular moment, is this person the best fit at this time? And I heard what Sarah, I think I understood Sarah to say, and I'm, and what I was leaning toward is that because we have lost so many people off of the ZBA recently and Steve and Joan who are remaining, thank goodness, have not been there forever. You know, it's not one of those committees where you have a couple people who've been there forever. And so I think it, it might actually be helpful to them to have Keith back in a full member position. So that was kind of, you know, because we're going with our initial assumptions here, right, before we're changing our minds. Um, so definitely Tammy, probably Keith. Um, for the third position, I the reason I'm struggling is with uh, between Dylan and Peter associated with that. 
I, one of the things that stands out for me about Dylan beyond his obvious youth is that, and the fact that he chose to move back here, is that he actually has been much more engaged recently than some of the other applicants have been in terms of like what kinds of things are people saying. I mean, he just ran for office and he's been coming to recent meetings of various different bodies, listen to the audio, um, you know, and just really felt like he really dived in to this. And at the same time, I also hear the concern about having people serve on two committees. In the olden days, that was much more common that people served on two or three committees. I think one of the things we're always trying to look at here is whether or not that's, you know, the best idea in the world. Yet at the same time, if someone says they can handle the workload, we all know how you get something done is you ask a busy person to do it. So I, I, I'm struggling um, with this. I think that, um, but in terms of full membership, I think for me, it's between those four. I wouldn't want Dylan to be disqualified simply because um, he's being put forward for Board of License Commissioners, because I do think the roles are significantly different with different amounts of workload. I don't think it's like putting somebody on ZBA and planning board at the same time, which would be weird and not really workable. Um, or, you know, some of our... <sighs> But Board of License Commissioners is still a fairly new body, but there are five people to spread the work across. One of the things I think makes it our job a little less fraught in general is when we get to figuring out the associates is that we get to keep more people than we usually do when we interview people. And so that's giving me some confidence that it's going to work out one way or another. George, I see your hand up. Can I just... Alyssa, could you just repeat who your three people are? Because I didn't quite get that. Well, I can't because I have four. Yeah. I heard, <laughs> I heard <laughs> Keith, Tammy, and then Dylan or Peter. Yes. Okay. Uh, George, your hand was up. Yeah, um, I think this is obvious to listen to everyone. I'll just say it, but um, it seems that one way out of this is to offer um, Dylan associate membership. Um, as opposed to full. I'm just, as I said, very uncomfortable with some, someone serving on both of these bodies as a full member, given the demands that um, I assume both of those bodies place on their members. Um, and there are no associates on the Board of License uh, Commissioners. It's, it's all five of them, that's true, but there's also five here. So um, again, I'm not gonna fall on my sword over this, but um, I just have great concern, no matter who the person is, and I think Dylan is, is very well qualified. And so if, if the majority of you want to offer him a full membership, um, I would suggest an associate membership would be appropriate. Um, but I also understand that Ben raises, well, then who would be the fifth candidate? But um, anyway, that's my thought. Okay, so watching, um, Okay, so hold on, I'm taking lots of notes. So the one thing that there seems to be complete agreement on is moving Tammy up. So I am going, can I actually edit this? Uh, hold on. I am going to actually open, if you will all bear with me for just a minute, I am going to try and actually edit this document so we can see, see our decision since we have so many choices uh, in front of us. So, share screen. Okay, you should all be seeing this Word document now. Um, so the one thing that I'm hearing definite consensus on is Tammy Parks into one of the associate memberships. And we'll, we'll talk about terms later, um, which now leaves this vacant. So, that one was easy. And then I am hearing 
Keith, Peter, and Dylan. So there seems to be consensus, at least among uh, those three. So we had um, three for Keith, three for Dylan, and three for Peter, only because Alyssa voted for four candidates. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, I will add, I, I've kept my mouth shut because I wanted to hear from you all first. Um, I would, of course, agree with Tammy. Um, so that one's easy. I would also be supportive of putting Keith back onto the body. Um, the reason for doing so are twofold. One is what we did hear from um, all of the current members and even former members that we spoke to tonight um, was that the loss of Mark Parent is going to be a great loss to this body. And one thing that we know, and Sarah mentioned this earlier, um, is that Mark was very supportive of putting Keith back onto the body. He even came and spoke to our committee at one point um, about his feelings about losing Keith from the body. And so um, I think there was a feeling from him as though Keith could really bring needed skills. The other thing, as, as was pointed out, is this is a body that has lost uh, quite a few people just over the past um, seven months. And Joan and Steve, I'm very thankful they're still there. Uh, they were initially appointed as associate members in 2017 and appointed full members in 2019. And so they are also uh, still relatively new to the body in that they have only been full members of the body for just over a year. I don't necessarily know how often they were utilized as associates in those two years prior, uh, perhaps a lot, perhaps not, I don't know. Um, but this isn't a situation where uh, Steve or Joan have six years of experience on the body. Um, they are still, I think, fairly new members. And I, so I think that bringing Keith's experience back to the body, um, especially coming out of what has been a fairly turbulent time for this body, taking everything else that's going on in the world out of the equation um, would be really useful. And then as for the third person, um, I, I was going also going back and forth between Dylan and Peter. I think that Dylan brings a really, really important, valuable perspective, uh, not just as a young person, um, but also as someone who um, is a renter who, you know, we heard a lot tonight about, um, you know, a, a lot of debates on the ZBA that have to do with thinking about rentals versus non-rentals. And so I think having that perspective is really important. And I think that he brings a really underrepresented voice. I do share some of George's concerns that um, I'm so happy that Dylan has moved back to our community and I don't want to welcome him back by crushing him with two very uh, high, heavy workload committees that involve a lot of research. Uh, I trust his ability to do them, um, but I also don't want to burn him out just as he has uh, re-entered our community. And so uh, I would perhaps lean a little bit more towards Peter for that. Um, so I want to throw it back to you, given out all that we have. We have somewhat equal votes for Peter, Dylan, and Keith. Um, we can take a vote, but I would really rather us talk through it for a little bit first and try to come to some type of consensus. Yes, George. I'm wondering if um, it's permissible or sensible or appropriate to offer uh, Dylan the full membership, but, and I don't know that we can set conditions, but maybe with the understanding that if he were to accept it, um, that he would have to withdraw. Is that just, just not appropriate? Is that, um, um, that's, I'd be open to his, uh, my resistance here it's just that this is more than that, A, you should ask of anyone, um, and B, no matter how much they say they can do it, I don't think that's wise. Um, so maybe it would be a question of which would he prefer, but perhaps that's just not appropriate. We can't do that. We can't set conditions. We either have to recommend someone or we don't. Um, so maybe my suggestion is, is foolish, but that would be something I'd be open to if that were possible. If not, um, uh, it would be with a heavy heart, but I would say that I couldn't vote for full membership simply because I don't think these are positions that one person, no matter how much they are committed, uh, can or should 
take on. Okay, uh, Alyssa and then Sarah. I just want to be clear that I, given that they are two different appointing authorities with different approval processes, I don't think we can horse trade like that in a way that we could if, if we were the direct appointing authority, which we are not, and in either case. So I don't think we can make that conditional. I think that there are definitely going to be other people on the town council who share both the view that one, if somebody signs up for two and feels they can do two, more power to them, and others who are gonna say exactly what George and Evan have just said. So from the standpoint of perhaps not overly complicating our recommendation to town council, given that a recommendation is going to be coming before town council, not from OCA anymore, but from TSO associated with the Board of License Commissioners, I would not want TSO to be looking at Dylan's Board of License Commissioner appointment askance because of what, as it turns out, the majority of us are all on both of those bodies. So it's <laughs> awkward beyond belief, but I guess if it is of deep concern to people, then the solution is either one, which I briefly entertained and then dismissed for the reasons that I said, which was to put Keith as an associate instead of as a full member. But then I realized now I really I agree with what other people have said about needing him back there. Um, the other is to put Dylan then in the associate position purely because of his other commitment to the Board of License Commissioners, which we assume we don't know because we're not there yet at TSO we'll be evaluating and then the town council will be evaluating. Uh, Sarah? So I would say in giving this thought, um, I still really want to have Keith on because I, I don't want the ZBA to fall apart and I don't want people on the ZBA to feel like they are rudderless and that they're also burnt out and I really think we need to have at least one more person who has experience and that's why I really want to hold on to Keith. Um, I'm hearing what everybody's saying about, um, you know, Dylan maybe being, you know, that it would be overwhelming and that we would burn him out. And, you know, I guess in the respect that when I ran for town council, I knew it would be really hard and I knew it would be a lot of work. I had no idea until I was on town council how much work um, there was. So in that respect, I could see, um, I would agree with other Peter, people that Peter is would be my second choice. So I am willing to um, put Peter in as a full member and Dylan as an associate, mem associate member and then just see how things work out for him. That's fine with me. Okay, Darcy. Um, I uh, am sad that people are changing their votes about Dylan. Um, I I think that our our uh, committee boards and committee handbook is very clear that people can be on two committees, and that it isn't up to us to decide that. If he went forward with the interview today and he still wants to do it, I don't, and, and we think that he is, uh, fulfills the qualifications, then I don't think it's our role to decide on his behalf that he's going to be burned out. <laughs> um, because uh, our, our town allows people to be on two committees. Um, so anyway, I feel pretty strongly that we need youth on this committee. Um, we're, we're constantly saying we need more diversity. And so um, I think that uh, he, and he has applied for several different committees and he uh, has complained about the fact that we need more diversity and we need more people who are working class um, and so I feel strongly that we should be appointing Dylan. Um, 
and I feel um, uh, like, well, I've already said that I, I think it's less important than that we have um, Keith on the committee because uh, of the fact that he's already had seven years and we have this whole big group of people that are anxious to serve and we should let them have a chance. George. I think this is why I am going to miss you all. Um, <laughs> this committee, um, I think Darcy makes a very, very good point. And others of you have made this point as well. And I'm the one who uh, started with the idea. I think Darcy's right. Um, she makes a very good point that uh, why am I or us, why are we deciding? Um, it is allowed. I have concerns, I have reservations, but I also hear the argument of youth and diversity. And um, so uh, I find RC's arguments actually pretty compelling. Uh, I know it, I'm arguing against myself, but um, <laughs> I, it's, that's okay. I think that's part of what we're trying to do. We're just thinking this out. And, and Evan has asked us to do that. And in the end, um, we'll decide what we decide. But um, I hear very much Darcy's point of youth. I, others of you made it, diversity. Um, and I think she does make a very good point that who are we or I to decide if it's allowed, and it is, um, maybe we should uh, just do it and um, we'll see how it works out. We have a very strong candidate. We have two strong candidates, but um, this one brings also youth and something that we've been sadly missing in some of the other appointments we've had to make and it's nobody's fault. Um, so I hear what she's saying and um, I am willing to change my vote um, for that reason. Um, in spite of what I said earlier, I still have those reservations, but I think she's right. Who am I or we to decide if it's allowed um, it's up to the candidate and maybe he'll decide in the end, he, he'll decide, we'll see. So I think we should do what we think is best. And I, given the arguments I'm hearing from some of the others and from Darcy, um, his youth and his passion and um, put him in a very strong place. So I'm open to him as a full member. Uh, I hope it doesn't create total chaos here, but that's, that's you know, <laughs> Oh, we think, love chaos here. Well, I, I just think she makes two really good points. Um, no, I, I agree. And I think what I'm struggling with is, is um, the feeling of if, if I was appointing from this body in sort of a vacuum, I would definitely put him on this body. And it's just this other consideration, but perhaps that is not a good way um, to look at things. One other thing that I, that I am also thinking, and this is inspired by something Alyssa said um, when she voted for the amendment to the open containers bylaw, where she said, if it doesn't work, we can just change it. Um, and, and there is a thought I have of, we're speculating about this, but if it gets to a point where uh, he does come to us and say, and, and, and we all know Dylan because he ran and some of us know him personally, and he says, Oof, this is this is real tough. I don't know if I can do this. Uh, we would because we have actually a decent number of candidates. We will likely have a full associate pool, and um, as the appointing authority, we could also always um, move one of those associates. Uh, so I'm also hearing Darcy's argument and willing to consider it. Uh, Alyssa, you've had your hand up. I want to give you a chance to speak. Thank you. I was actually hoping you were going to speak before I did. Um, so uh, this is why deliberation and open meeting law is really hard, but it's also really valuable, as George points out, because we, we tease out each other's arguments, right? We, we hear how it's sounding. And, you know, I was worried at the beginning that I was like, you know, we have this, we have Dylan be great, but are we going to have any trouble convincing the rest of the council about the same argument we're having here? And maybe it just simplifies everybody's life, including Dylan's, right? Because he's going to get talked about a lot, just like he's getting talked about now, if, if we just simplify. And then the longer the conversation went on and Darcy expressed again so clearly why we've been looking 
for um, different points of view, and we have all interacted with Dylan, um, is that when based on his, and, and it's become really obvious to me that I was trying to simplify perhaps at the expense of doing actually the best thing. And I still stand by the fact that Dylan, of all the rest, you know, not looking at Sharon because she said she wants to stay associate, but of the rest of the candidates that aren't Tammy and Keith, Dylan, I feel like is the most qualified to be the full member in terms of the homework he's done, in terms of figuring out what the ZBA does, in terms of his recent engagement in community, uh, you know, interaction. And so the other thing that I think it just expands a little on what Evan said about if it doesn't work out, then, you know, whatever, it, we have options. It's also true that if it, in the short run, if it's a problem for any of these new full members to actually make the commitment, then that's when they call the associate, right? Like they're running into some sort of problem in their lives. That's when staff calls and for an associate to serve on the next panel instead of that full member. So we wouldn't be leaving, what I'm saying is we wouldn't be leaving applicants or the ZBA in the lurch. It seems unlikely that that would be a problem. So I think that I'm starting to hear us move more towards putting Dylan to a full membership. We know Darcy definitely supports it. We know that Sarah and I'm, I'm hearing me, George and Alyssa starting to lean in that direction. Um, would, would we say yes. that's an accurate? George? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw his name in there then. Dylan Max. It's very exciting for me to get the majority of people to agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> you made a very compelling argument. You made a very compelling <laughs> argument. <laughs> Um, so here's where I'm going to disagree with you, Darcy. Uh, so now we have a question about this, this third seat. Um, if, if I had to choose now between Peter and Keith, who both were originally in my top three, I would lean towards uh, Keith. So it sounds like it's between Keith and Peter. So I'd like us to have that conversation. Does anyone have, I mean, everyone has stated their, their preference. Um, it can, if, if, if people feel like they've said their piece, um, we can actually vote on this one individually, um, or much like we did with Dylan, we can see if we can come to some consensus between Keith and Peter. It looks like I'm the only person who has Peter on my list. Um, so George originally did, and I originally did, and Alyssa gave us four originally, and so Peter was on it. So, so I think that it, the seat is really between Peter and, and Keith. Um, my preference is for Keith. Um, uh, I, know, I know that Sarah's because Peter wasn't on her original top three. Um, if others want to speak otherwise. Um, I think that the value that, that Peter brings is, is I, I mean, sorry. Well, I think the value that Peter brings would be really important, but I think that the experience that Keith brings um, would really be invaluable at this point. Uh, George? I'm repeating, I think, what I said, and I apologize to everyone, but um, I think, yes, the experience is needed. We've got a body that's down to two, um, and he brings uh, really invaluable experience. And um, if we were in different circumstances, I'd make a very, I think I would think about it very differently. Um, so Keith is definitely the candidate that I would support. Other thoughts? Shall we just um, uh, Alyssa? I know you said we'd talk about term length later, and I know that I never actually follow directions when you say we can <laughs> talk about things at certain points in time, because to me, as always, they're connected. And so one of the things I wonder if, I mean, we, we obviously will have the vote that we have, but one of the things that I think we need to consider is we've currently got two full members who are expiring in 22. So that would be like a two-year term. Mm -hmm. And so we would want to have some combination of 
one and three year terms amongst our three new people, so to speak, our three new foals, even though Tammy's not really a new person. And so I would be open to the argument that Keith would only get a one year term, even though I know we talked about the things that he's gonna bring, but if that makes people feel more comfortable with the fact that he's served in the past, that he can help us through this next period, it does not mean he could not get reappointed. He absolutely could get reappointed after the one year term. I mean, there's not like a clock that that ticks away from, but that might um, help people feel more balanced if we ended up giving Tammy and Dylan three year terms, right? Because we've already got two people with two year terms and then give Keith a one maybe would that address some of the concern about the length of time he's been on? Yes, it would. So that's that's something to consider. I'm, I'm not sure I'm completely on board with that, but um, as you always do, Alyssa, I try and lay out some ground rules and then you tell me, you show me why those ground rules don't always make sense because it might not make sense to consider some of these outside the context of term length. Um, so, Darcy, do you, do you, you would, um, prefer Peter to Keith? Yes. But are you open to Keith if it was a one-year term? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to put Keith in here and we're not voting on anything yet. So all of this could still change. Uh, put in the capitals. Langsdale. Okay, so that's our full member. So now we have um, associate members. Now, historically, we've only appointed three, um, but we do have the option of doing up to four. Uh, Alyssa, is this a new hand? No. Okay. Um, and so, yes, it is. Go ahead, Alyssa. I know. I'm just torturing you. Yeah, I realized <laughs> it was still on, and I was like, no, wait, but what? What do I do now? Um, Actually, to be fair, we have in the longer ago past had four associate members. We realized when we changed from a three member board to a five member board that it was going to be harder because as we all found when we tried to recruit for this position, people said zoning. Mm -hmm. um, but we are, it is, it has been four members, it has been three members, it can be two mem it has been two members if enough people leave or and or get moved up. So it's just a very variable number. And the thing that's always so confusing to people, but of course not to us, because we've been studying this, is that although I know they use the term alternate, they are alternates from the standpoint of yes, if one person that's normally one of the five can't serve for either a conflict of interest or a scheduling conflict that they ask one of the other people to serve. It's not like you're an alternate juror like you see on TV where they impanel 15 people but only let 12 of them vote, right? So mostly yeah. they don't even show up to the other panels unless they're actually on them. So um, it's good to have as big a pool as you can for associates. It's been, we haven't yet had enough of a pool to, to fill off for since we moved to a five member body. Mm -hmm. um, voices is what I'm saying. Okay. So I want to just throw something out there to, to see if this would simplify this. So um, we have, my, from what I heard in the answer to the very last question, it sounded as though Bob Greeny was withdrawing his application for ZBA so that he could be considered for planning board in a future round of appointments. Um, and I, if I misheard that, then someone please correct me. But if that is the case, then we have three names left, Peter Barrick, Craig Meadows, and then Sharon Waldman. And so I guess my, my, the way I'd like to do this, which is different from what we just did is I would like to ask if there is anyone who has a reason or a thought on just on not appointing one of those three people to the associate membership, because otherwise I think there's an argument to make that if we didn't see anyone who said anything we thought was in conflict with the selection guidance and we have three remaining candidates and we have four associate member slots, we could put them in unless someone has a reason not to. 
Darcy, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any um, objection to any of them. And I, I'm not clear on what Bob said. Um, I would, I would be willing to and advocate for giving him the fourth position because um, if he doesn't want it, he can decline it. Um, and I, I know that he has applied for a number of different positions and uh, I just think it would be very uh, respectful of him to offer him that position. Um, so the, I, I advocate for filling, filling all of the positions with the people that we have. Um, I, you know, I think they're, and one question I do have is how, how do, how do the, how are the associate members chosen to serve when someone is absent or they don't have a quorum or whatever? How, how do, how do they choose who of the associate members do that? Uh, I don't know that. Answer. I don't know if it's if it's. I assume it's staff. But if Alyssa has a better answer, I would once again defer to her knowledge. Okay, this one's out of date knowledge. So okay. I will just say out of date knowledge is a couple of planners ago that they would basically kind of keep a list of what people's schedules were like. And so like if somebody was always away at a certain time of year or whatever, then they wouldn't call them if something came up during that particular time. But it, they partly, they traditionally have tried to rotate people through so that you don't run into the problem I mentioned hours ago of the idea of an associate being on there for a couple of years, but maybe never actually got to serve on a panel. So largely because they don't, because they aren't used to meeting every couple of weeks, they sometimes end up with other commitments. And so it's really just a matter, traditionally it's just been a matter of juggling. Okay, uh, so it goes George and then Sarah. I'm wondering if uh, I should let Sarah speak first. Um, <laughs> can I yield? You can if you want. No, I, it's not fair. Um, I should say what I think. Um, Again, I'm hearing uh, Darcy's argument. Um, Bob has very persistently applied um, over and over again. And um, perhaps we should, uh, you know, reward him for his persistence. He certainly in his written and spoken comments, he's expressed that a desire to, um, to he understands the body. Um, I think maybe well, I don't want to speculate as to, you know, what he might be thinking. That's not fair. But I would be open to offering him the fourth position. Um, okay. Sarah? So from what I heard from what Bob said was that he felt very comfortable with the other people who were running. And because he would rather be on planning board, he would... Um, he was withdrawing because he didn't want this to um, hinder him from the possibility of being on planning board. That said, I don't have any problem, you know, putting him in um, as an associate, associate member, but I do think we should definitely check with him about what he wants, because if it's his preference to not take this, either that or we talk, we talk about, you know, planning board and whether or not this would you know, hinder him in his application for planning board. So I think we should just check with him first, but I don't, we can always, you know, change that. I don't mind putting him in right now. Alyssa? Yeah, I think this is where it gets complicated because of the transition we're about to undergo, right? From OCA to TSO associated, or from OCA to CRC in this case, um, as to, the future planning board appointments. So while technically we have every intention as OCA of finishing the planning board from the standpoint of the terms that are expiring June 30th, there's no guarantee because one never knows what the pool is going to be that no matter how much Bob might want it, that he will necessarily get that position, nor can we guarantee it will happen a year from now because a different body will be deciding that 
year from now and people could resign in the meantime, et cetera, just like unfortunately they've done associated with ZBA. Um, so I guess my assumption is to offer the associate position to Bob with the under and explain to him that it would have, which I assuming we all agree on this, that it would have zero impact on his ability to be fully considered for planning board because we would assume, because I don't really think you can serve on both of those, we would assume that he would uh, resign from ZBA if in fact he got appointed to planning board. And so this is not the Dylan situation we were talking about. This is two different zoning things that I don't really think you can serve on both. And I don't think he's any intention of serving on both, but we do have and have had people in the past serve on the ZBA first, get kind of get their feet wet with the zoning bylaw and then end up serving on the planning board at a later time. So it's not an unusual trajectory to move from ZBA to planning board. It's definitely not usual to try and serve on both. He clearly doesn't want to serve on both, but to offer him the opportunity because we can't guarantee him he's going to get a seat on planning board, but I think we can guarantee him since it's the five of us that we will not hold it in any way, shape or fashion against him if he chooses to apply for planning board again. George, is this a new hand or an old hand? This is a new hand. Okay, go on. Um, again, I think I'm back to Darcy's argument earlier that um, we shouldn't be making these decisions for the candidates. They really are, if this is permissible, or basically if we feel that he is qualified or as qualified as the other three members that we're putting as associates, and I think that is a fair statement, then we should go, the, the position is vacant. He meets the qualifications. I heard nothing from him tonight um, that would, would disqualify him. Um, and so I guess we shouldn't try to, you know, do our, his thinking for him. I think Sarah's correct that what I heard is pretty much what she heard, but our decision, you know, he did not withdraw. And so he is a candidate. And um, unless someone has a, a real concrete reason for saying he's not qualified and there is a position open, um, I like the idea of us filling all, all the slots. Um, so I think we should put him as the fourth at least offer him the fourth position. Okay, so the last piece of this, and then we can all go to bed, is term limits. Um, so Alyssa put forth an idea earlier of because Keith has been there for a while and because Darcy had some discomfort with, with Keith being here of giving Keith a one year term um, and giving, uh, Tammy and Dylan two year term, uh, sorry, three year terms. And so we would have staggered reappointments in 21, 22, and 23. Um, so that's one suggestion on the table. I, I was actually going to say something different, which was given um, the conversation we had around the workload that Dylan faced, perhaps he would be a good candidate to give the one year term to. He would obviously be right for reappointment at the end of that one year because he would only have served one year. Um, but then we could say, so why is that manageable? And if he says, yes, there's of course a preference for reappointment. Um, and so it would be sort of a make sure, you know, uh, uh, first step. So I think there's a couple different options um, here. I personally would like to see at the very least Tammy Parks get a three year term. Um, so my, my preference would be Tammy and Keith three-year terms and a Dylan a one-year term, but I'm open to suggestions. I see George's hand. That was my thinking, um, that it would seem, given the situation, that uh, Dylan would get the one-year term and then he would be open for reappointment if everything works out and he wants to do it. Um, and Keith um, would get the three and Tammy would get the three. Okay. Other uh, thoughts? Uh, Alyssa, I see your hand. I disagree. I want, I, I, Tammy's so easy for us tonight, right? So three year term for Tammy, for sure. Um, I would have been happy to give either Keith or Dylan two year terms rather than one year term, except for the fact that we already have two others expiring in 2022. And that 
um, based on experience is a horrible idea to have a whole bunch of people expiring at once. Um, we could actually give all three of them three year terms and just not have anybody expire next year. But again, not a great idea with a body of five. It's usually good to have a change. I feel more comfortable saying, I feel like we're giving, I feel like I'm giving Keith a year because of we need you back, Keith. We had you for a long time. I'm not sure I'm ready to commit to three years at this point, given his length of service in the past and the fact that we're hoping other leaders develop, um, continue to develop on this body. And we've got Tammy, who's only been there a year, and Dylan, who will also be new. And as you said, Joan and Steve haven't been there forever. So I'm less comfortable with that. I, I understand why people are saying that a year for Dylan, but I'm not thrilled about it. Okay, uh, Sarah? So I'm gonna pretty much echo what Alyssa just said. Um, I, I would, it, so for two reasons, all the reasons that Alyssa said, and then also the fact that I think that OCA really tries to work together. And I saw a really, just a really great, um, compromise being made um, that that Darcy was willing to do and I think that's important for this committee even if we're you know dissolving in a couple months um, so I think it would be more appropriate to give Keith the one year knowing that you know if he could be you know just reappointed again okay Darcy I see your hand up uh, I'm happy to hear Alyssa and Sarah agreeing um, that uh, on a one year term for Keith. And I just want to point out that your reasons for wanting to check in with Dylan after a year are exactly the same. <laughs> They're um, us, you know, somehow being concerned about Dylan's workload. Um, and it doesn't make any sense as far as I'm concerned that that should be a reason for giving someone a one year term to check in with them. You know, they're there. He's, he's a grown up now. <laughs> he can figure it out. Um, but anyway, I, I, um, you know, I think it would be nice if we all agreed and could go to bed on the one year term that is for Keith. George, your hand is up. I would like that to be true too, but um, I really can't agree to that. I, I think um, I think that Keith um, is unlikely to get another appointment. Um, and uh, a one-year appointment given what we need and given the situation on the body. Um, and that's one, you know, it's, um, I think we should really think hard about what we're asking him to do and under these conditions. Um, I agree with Darcy that, you know, it, the Dylan Maxfield one year, um, but we need someone with one year to balance out the the appointments and um i really think that that we need to give uh, keith more than a year if we're really serious about putting someone on here who has experience on a body that is uh, could really use it um i wish two years were an option i'd be open to that and i certainly would be open to the thought that given the length of service that he's already had that this would be the last time that that he would be uh serving but um so I, I can't, unfortunately for us all, I can't agree to a one-year term for Keith. Um, I think um, I just can't do that. Um, I think he's needed. And um, I, I do think that this would be the, whatever service he provides us, this is the last time he's going to do it. Um, and I think we need more than one year. Is, is there, so I mean, Alyssa made the statement that we could give them all three years, but then we have three members of the body in theory potentially turning over at once. And that could be 
detrimental to the body and that could also be detrimental to the counselors in 2023 who have to deal with it. Um, but I, I guess I, I, I am in George's camp of, I, I don't have a strong opinion on what dealing gets a one, two or three year term, to be honest. It was just, if we have to give someone a one year, that would be my preference and Keith would get a three. Uh, I, I'm also open to giving all three of them three, especially since we have four associate members who will be up in 2021. Um, and that would be a lot too. Uh, oh, Alyssa, sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm, and there's not a perfect answer here. There's no question, but I, I'm going to push back a little bit on, on something George said associated with Keith not getting another term after this. I don't know why I'd be second guessing CRC on that. I don't think it matters how many times you appoint someone. I think it matters the length of service that they have overall. And I'm not eager to give three more years to someone who's already served seven years on a body. That seems like a lot. That's why I'm saying in a year, that's why I'm not saying, that's why I'm saying go ahead and appoint him, right? We need him for a year, but we agreed to appoint Mark for a year, even though he'd served a good length of time because we wanted him to help them through a year. Could, would I have kept Mark longer given the choice if he'd asked to stay yet another year rather than having to actually leave? I probably would have gone another year. I don't understand why CRC in the future wouldn't say, you know, well, Keith, we really appreciate what you've done for this for the past year. Would you go ahead and do it for another two or three years or one more year? I think that would be a reasonable expectation to have of CRC. George. Oh, um, uh, Alyssa makes good arguments. Darcy makes, I mean, these are, these are good arguments. I just really feel the need for some continuity and I'm worried about a one-year appointment being interpreted uh, in a way that it's not intended just because why? Well, I mean, the reason that Alyssa's giving is a strong one and the others, which is that he's already had seven years and now it would be 10 years. And I think that in normal circumstances, that would be, uh, that would be it. We, wouldn't, wouldn't, we would consider it. And I guess the rest of you don't see the situation quite as in the way I do. And I'm, maybe I'm just wrong here. Um, but uh, I wish we could do two years. Uh, I just would like to uh, have uh, the benefit of his experience. And I mean, the man has chaired um, this body. And um, we're having two people come up in 2022 who knows if they'll continue. Um, so um, I guess I would go with Evan's idea of three years for all three. Uh, but I hear obviously the concern of, of many of you that that's, that's, that seems to be just too much given the idea of term limits. Um, and I would agree with you in most circumstances, but here I, I really am concerned about um, having some stability and some experience. Um, this is correct. I, I, that doesn't mean he can't be, uh, get another term after three years. I think that would be extremely unlikely, um, but she's right. I can't predict the future. So I'll shut up. Sarah. So I'm gonna say that, um, I don't feel like I want to move on that one year term for Keith. I would like to keep that. Um, that being said, I'm also on CRC and I could also see myself in a year taking a look at the, the configuration of the ZBA and definitely, you know, I, if it's appropriate, I would not, I would totally give Keith, um, another term. I mean, I think what all of this is about is that we have guidelines. Um, we have ideas about how long people serve and, and, and making sure that we have senior members, making sure that we have new voices. If in a year's time, we find that we still don't have, you know, people that can step up and that Keith has really, you know, kept this entire you know, board together, then I don't see why CRC wouldn't say these are, this is where the board is at right now, ZBA, and definitely we would need to keep Keith on. So I'm going to stay firm in my one year for Keith. 
So I'm going to throw something out there that I expect will fail, but why not? Um, so George and I, I think, have spoken pretty clearly that we would like to see Keith get a three-year term. Uh, Sarah, Darcy, and Alyssa are advocating for a one-year. We could certainly vote on this. It's a vote I expect that George and I would be in the minority and we would lose and that would be okay and, and we could move on. Um, the, one, the one number that hasn't been thrown out is two, right? I mean, if it was a three-year term, there'd be three people expiring in 2023. If there is a two-year term, there'd be three people expiring in 2022. I, I'm less concerned about that. Is there any appetite for meeting in the middle and doing a two-year term? Especially because the, the, the thing I'm also hearing is we can give him a one-year term and yeah, he could be reappointed. So if, if that's sort of the attitude, is it, is it possible to, to meet in the middle and do a two-year? Uh, Sarah. So um, I want to stay with the one year and I'm going to back that up by saying I, well, I wouldn't automatically just give Keith another year. I think that what Oka has talked about is looking at the health of the entire committee. And I can't say what this is, the, what, you know, ZBA is going to look like in another year. So I, I just would want to take a, a look in another year. I just, I, I'm not willing to budge on that. George? Quick one last effort. Um, this is someone who has served for seven years. He's clearly um, passionate about it and enjoys it and um, has given a great deal to the town. And um, I also feel there's maybe a, just a matter, and maybe this will not go over well, but just a, a matter of respect. Um, he did not apply for this position with the thought, I mean, I'm, I assume he applied with the thought that it would be a multi-year uh, commitment. Um, I understand the reasons for offering him one, but I'm, I'm also concerned about just the, you know, just showing some level of what, appreciation, respect for service people have given. If you're going to put him on the body, um, you should put him on the body. Um, the, the situation with Mark Parent was special. Um, Mark stayed on as really almost a courtesy um, for a year, and it was understood from the beginning. Um, here, I think if I were Mr. Langsdale, uh, if I were anyone who had served uh, uh, as much as he has, and um, then is appointed to a one-year position, I would, I would probably uh, be a little bit offended. Now, maybe I, um, so that's another concern I have. Um, just a matter of, of respect for people who have done service. Um, okay, it uh, goes Darcy, then Alyssa. Um, I think I'm ready to make a motion. Um, is there any problem with that? You can always make a motion. Um, I would like to move that Oka recommend to the town council um, the appointment of Keith Langsdale for uh, a term of one year um, to the Zoning Board of Appeals as full member, Dylan Maxfield and Tammy Parks for ter a term expiring in 2023, um, in other words, a term of three years, um, also as full members to the ZBA. That was a little convoluted but I think you got the meaning. Okay. Um, is there a second? Second. Was that Sarah or Alyssa? Sorry, it was Alyssa. Okay. <laughs> I could see Sarah's face and I heard Alyssa's voice and it, it get very confusing. Uh, <laughs> Alyssa, you've had your, your hand up. Yes, I did about the respect oh. issue. So speaking as someone who's been around for a while, um, I don't know why we keep hearing that weird noise in the back. 
that's the train that's going by my house. I'm about to eat myself. Awesome. Um, is that's a good noise. Is I am sorry that it it feels to George like a lack of respect because I do not mean it that way at all. I respect the seven years that he's already devoted to the ZBA, and I respect that Mark and others have so much respect for him that they really feel like it's important to bring him back. And whereas, you know, a lot of other people, you'd say six years, bye-bye, thanks for that. Um, and so I would be, I like to think that my ego, which is somewhat of a real thing too, um, would say, great, they want me back for a year to see what I can do. And if I don't think I can get done what I need to get done in a year, then I'm gonna say, you know what? You need to keep me for longer. I would not say, oh, you wouldn't appoint me for three years? Well, forget you. I just, I just can't understand unless we tell him that we're doing it to insult him, which is not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we want his expertise back for a year and to see where we're at at the end of that year because we value the experiences he brings. Uh, George, you have your hand up. I don't know if Evan agrees with me on this, but I think it's important on a decision like this that we, we reach consensus. And I can see which way the wind is blowing um, and it's not blowing in my direction. So I would prefer that personally, and I can't speak for Evan, that if the, this seems to be the consensus or the majority position is one year, I'd rather have his um, uh, vote as a full body 5-0 uh, with what we're going to put forward to the, uh, to the council. I know I would not, uh, before the council, make a passionate argument over term limits or term length, even though I personally don't agree with um, some of the things we've said tonight. Um, uh, that's not, so, not something I would do. So I would, um, if, if it, it seems to be clear that there's a, a, a majority for one year for keep, I prefer that we um, do this by consensus or a vote of five to zero. But uh, I obviously I can't vote for Evan and I can't speak for him, but uh, I'm not going to uh, vote against the motion um, simply because I, I really would like the council to have a sense that, that we were broadly speaking, and I think we are, Broadly speaking, an agreement. Um, so um, I'm not going to vote against this motion, uh, even though I don't agree about the term limits, um, because I'd like us to have consensus, or at least as close to consensus as we can get. So since George invoked my name, I'll, I'll speak. Um, I'm sorry, Evan. I apologize. But... Uh, Alyssa, you have your hand up. Nope. Oh, okay. Um, I feel actually very uncomfortable with the one year term. Um, I think that Keith brings a lot of experience. He, he brings a lot to the table. Um, and I, I don't want to give Keith a one year term. I don't want, I, I actually feel sort of uncomfortable with one year terms in general, um, with the exception at the very start of a body. Um, makes sense when a body is first started, such as when ECAC was started, that some people got one-year terms so that you could start the initial staggering. I'm really uncomfortable with one-year terms just generally, actually. And so we gave Mark Parent a one-year term um, because he asked for it, right? I mean, that wasn't actually a decision. That was a decision we made, but in part it was because he asked for only one more year. Um, on the finance committee, we gave Mary Lou uh, a one-year term because she had served for for so long for over a decade um but i think that broadly speaking one year terms are a bad idea and i think that i would prefer to give him at least a two-year term i also share george's feelings that i'm not going to vote against the entire suite of appointments over that one little thing but it does make me feel very uncomfortable um giving out a one-year term um, and even though I sort of recommended it for Dylan, as I talked through it more and thought more about it, I actually thought I wouldn't even want to give Dylan a one-year term. And that was only out of a feeling that we had to do a one-year term. But as I've moved away from this feeling that someone has to get a one-year term, I actually don't think anyone of the full members should get a one-year term. Um, what I'd like to do, and I'm fine with this going down in flames, um, but I'd like it at least to be on the record, 
is I'd like to offer an amendment to the motion to amend Keith Langsdale's term to 2022. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Is there discussion on this amendment to move Keith Langsdale's term from 2021 to 2022? Darcy, I see your hand up. Yeah, I think that to some extent we lost sight of the fact that um, we would have, we, that we put Keith Langsdale's name uh, as a full member on the basis that um, that I said that I would agree if he had a one-year term. So um, if we're if he isn't going to have if we aren't all agreed that he's going to have a one-year term, or if we can't vote to do that, then we need to vote on that third position because I don't agree that he should be a full member. I would put Peter Barrick there. Um, so it's a bigger issue than just, I mean, we, ha we haven't all agreed that these are our three full members. Um, I, I haven't agreed on Keith, unless he has a one year term. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? Okay, then I'm going to call you a question. So again, the amendment is to amend keep, uh, amend the motion um, to strike 2021 and replace it with 2022 for Keith Langsdale's appointment. Uh, I will go in alphabetical order. Alyssa Brewer? No. Darcy Dumont? No. Uh, uh, Evan, sorry, I had to do the alphabet in my head. It's getting late. <laughs> um, <laughs> Evan Ross is yes. George Ryan. Yes. And Sarah Sports. No. Okay. The motion fails. Uh, two in favor, three opposed. So now we're back to the main motion, uh, which I'm not going to write the motion out on the screen. Um, so let me just I'll just permit me to type that up for my own record. Um, so I would like to actually amend the motion um, that is on the table, a different amendment, um, because Darcy's amendment only encompassed the full members. Um, and I would like to do this as one package of all the members. And so I would like to offer an amendment to the motion um, to add on to the motion that we recommend the appointment of uh, Bob Greeny, Sharon Waldman, Peter Barrick, and Craig Meadows as associate members for terms expiring June 30th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. So again, this is the first vote will be on the amendment just to add the associate appointments onto the original motion, which was only the three full members. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, then I will call the question. Yes, my hand is raised for oh. reals. I didn't see it. I'm sorry, Alyssa. Go ahead, Alyssa. <laughs> totally okay. We're exhausted. Um, I would just ask, you're going to kill me, but when we, when you put the chart together, because it's so pretty, when you fix it later, will you put people in alphabetical order or date it when it comes to the bottom? Yeah. That, because it just hurts my head. I, I, will, I will make it look better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any other discussion? Apologies to Alyssa. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember if I already started calling it. So um, the amendment is just to add the associate members. Uh, Dumont? Uh, yes. Ross is yes. Ryan? Yes. Swartz? Aye. And Brewer. Aye. Okay, so we're now to the amended motion, which is to recommend that the town council appoint to the Zoning Board of Appeals, of Appeals, uh, Tammy Parks and Dylan Maxfield for terms expiring June 30th, 2023, Keith Langsdale 
for a term expiring June 30th, 2021, and Bob Greeny, Sharon Waldman, Peter Berrick, and Craig Meadows as associate members for terms expiring June 30th, 2021. That's the motion that we're voting on. Is there any further discussion? Okay, so I'll start with Ross is yes. Ryan? Yes. Swartz? Yes, I. Brewer? I. And Dumont? Yes. Okay, so that is unanimous. The motion carries. We have our ZBA appointments. So I am going to, not tonight, um, but soon write this up into a report um, and it will go to the council and I will request that this is on the town council's agenda uh, for our next meeting, which I believe is April 27th. Are there any questions? Uh, Alyssa. I just want to thank you for getting us through this, Evan, because it was such a, it was a long night, starting late, et cetera, after a really busy town council week. We had an insane week. And so thank you for getting us through this and, and moving the interviews along and having everything work. Thank you to staff for being here. The other thing I just want to mention is I know that you'll write us a beautiful report and, you know, I assume you'll touch on the length of Keith's appointment so that it's clear we're not, the different viewpoints we had on that. Yes. Other questions or comments? Sarah? You are amazing, Evan. Thank you so much for all your hard work and for, for refereeing that. You were awesome. Thank you, Sarah. When social distancing is over, we're going to get some lemon bars. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Save one for me. <laughs> All right, so OCA's next meeting is on April 27th at 9.30 in the morning, and I will see you all then, and so I will adjourn us at 10.39 p.m. Thank you all.